Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinet Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinet. Guest today is Steve Banks. Steve, Steve, thanks for being here today. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me, Jason. Appreciate it very much so. So, Steve, first question. How do you take care of yourself, like mentally, physically? Like, you have a lot of stuff going on. We'll, we'll do a deep dive later on. But how do you take care of yourself? How do you make sure you're taking care of yourself? Oh, God, that's a loaded question. Well, I have a five-year-old and an eight-year-old, um, so I have to stay active. As a 48-year-old African-American male, I, um, I take pride in trying to stay physically fit. I'm in the gym playing basketball. I played college basketball. I played basketball in high school. That's, that's how I stay fit. I'm, I'm the old guy at the gym now. I get in the sauna. I get in the steam room. I got to stretch for 15, 20 minutes before I get on the court. <laughs> That's how I take care of myself. I try to walk. Uh, um, I try to be outside, man. I mean, I don't help. Like, people, like, uh, like I'm 55. There's no way I could have a five-year-old kid right now. You don't like, look 55. There's no way I would guess you were 55. Yeah, I I'm kind of old, yeah. But, I mean, I can imagine having a, like, five-year-old kid that you're at that age. Right? <sighs> yeah, my wife and I, we started late. <laughs> I, had to, I had to order a nanny or do something, right? Oh, well, That's I, the same. I wish I could. Trust me. Like, my wife is out of town today. She has a trip, a business trip to Los, or I think Los Angeles, somewhere in California. And so it's me and the boys for two days. But they're different with her than they are with me. I can handle it. So being like your kids are five and eight is like, suppose you would have had your kids like in your 20s. Yeah. You think having an older age have, has you think about legacy more versus when you were younger? Um, I probably think about legacy more so now, for sure. I mean, with everything that I do, um, I think about my wife and kids first, first and foremost, um, everything that I do, whether it's, I mean, it's funny. I mean, if, if you've been married or if you're married or have a partner, like I always feel like I have to ask, you know, like I check in with my wife, how are you doing? Can I go here? Can I go there? Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about this idea. What do you think? You know, get, getting her input is very important to me. And, and with my kids, with what's been going on in the world over the last several years, you know, just, you know, raising two young black men, um, I think about their legacy and, and what I want my legacy to be when I leave this earth, right? And preparing them for, you know, financial success, um, preparing them for college, just so they have the tools and resources, stuff that I didn't know when I was younger um, and no fault to my dad. My dad was a single parent, um, but he, he was amazing. My mom died when I was 10 years old. She died of lupus, but my dad was, my dad was awesome. He was the bomb, he was strict. Um, he held me to a high standard, sent me to private school when I didn't want to go to private school. Um, so legacy is, is very much so important. So the private school, is that the Bush school you're talking about? I went to the Bush school, yes. And you're, so, <laughs> and you're actually on the board of the Bush school now, right? I'm a board trustee. Can you talk about the whole yes. relationship, how you went there, and now you're like staying involved with it? Um, yeah, so I would say in the 80s, late 80s, gangs were starting to really, really be prevalent in the Seattle area. Um, more importantly in the CD, the central district where I grew up, 17th and Union. And um, my dad was just like, yeah, I gotta, I gotta, I have to get you out of this environment. A lot of my friends were turning to the streets. Um, you know, that we had like, you know, they were like, you know, you can be from 28th and something and you can be from 17th and Union, right? And, but you were beefing, <laughs> but you guys were all friends. You grew up together, right? So the, the little gangs, that was just kind of like the hood thing, but you know, once like the Crips and the blood started making their way up to see Seattle, like my dad was like, yeah, I gotta, I need something different for you. So he took me out of Meany Middle School. I was, I was, I was a public school kid. I went to TT Minor. I went to Meany Middle School. I went to Bryant Elementary School. Um, but when I was at Meany Middle School, my dad was just like, it's time. So he sent me to the Bush School. You know, he, we actually went on a couple of visits to several schools. Um, but Bush was close to home. Uh, my, my best friend, um, he wound up going to Lakeside. Um, uh, and for me at that time, Lakeside just seemed so far way up North, but had I known what I know now about Lakeside, <laughs> I probably would have chose Lakeside just because I mean, it's prestige. It's, it's a different level of prestige when you talk about Lakeside or when you talk about Bush, but it doesn't take away my experience at the Bush school. My experience at the Bush school was, it was eye opening. Again, you bring up the word legacy. Um, going to the Bush School exposed me to stuff that I had not been exposed to. You know, growing up in the hood, growing up in the CD. I mean, I remember going to um, one of my uh, best friends, childhood best friends. He grew up over in the Medina, um, Hunts, Clyde Hill area, Hunts Point area. 
and going over there for the first time and seeing how white folks lived and where I lived, two different worlds, right? Um, his family accepted me and treated me like I was one of their own, but I knew, okay, this is something different over here, right? <laughs> this is, I'm trying to be balling like this, right? So the East side growing up, if you were, if you were black and grew up in the CD or the South end, like you knew the East side was different than where you grew up. So very much so important. And, and the Bush school was amazing. I mean, being on the board of trustees there now is um, it's like a, it's come full circle for sure. Is it like a kindergarten or a twelfth grade school or? Bush is K through 12. Okay. Yep. K through 12. And I started in seventh grade. Okay. Yeah. I started at Bush. And you have to get, like, get like, take some kind of test that accepted or. Absolutely. Or... Yep. You, got, you have to take a test. Um, you know, they just want to see where your, where your mind, where your mind is. And it's, it's a, back when I went there, it was, it was more, I would say more of like a college prep type school. Like it was there. I mean, it was amongst the, the ranks of like the lakesides. You talk about the university preps. Nowadays, you're talking about Seattle Academy, SAS, but the Bush School is still one of the schools where, you know, and I, we just left a board retreat meet, um, retreat this past weekend. And one of the things, you know, that kept coming up for me is like Bush, the Bush School, it's a special place. And it's hard for me to put on it, like what makes Bush special. You have to go and visit it, but it's also not for everybody. Just like Lakeside is not for everybody. U prep or Northwest or SAS is not for everybody. There's a special type of individual that um, that fits the Bush school mode. And fortunately for me, I was one of those kids. And by no means was it easy. It was it was hard. And I mean, and back then, a lot has changed. We now have a black headmaster or head of school, I think is what they call him now, um, Percy Abram. Um, but when I went there, Bush was very much white. It was white. I mean, I could name on one hand how many black kids went to Bush when I was there. And you're like recruit people, or is it like just sort of mouth? Like, how do you bring students in? I'm sure being selected, you probably might not might need to might not need to recruit. Oh well, yeah, you don't need to recruit for Bush. I think um, I think there's always opportunities to market what the school, what what makes the school special, what the soul of the school, the heart of the school, what differentiates the Bush School from some of the other independent schools in the area. But um, it's not a school that you have to recruit people. People want to come there. I mean, there's waiting lists. To get into the Bush School, um, again, I mean it's 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 expensive. It's an expensive school, and again, I couldn't even tell you the exact amount of tuition right now. My kids don't attend, um, which I could see. My kid, my my eight year old, he's he's an analytical kid. He's very he's a thinker. He's a debater. He questions everything, which to some degree is good. Um, he's a he's a Bush kid. He now attends Saint Therese Catholic Academy. Um, like my fifth or like my uh, kindergartner, but uh, yeah, Bush, it's a special place, man. It's a good, it's a good school. So if a, if a parent wanted to apply to have his kid go to Bush, what kind of things they'd have to do? Like how to kind of get an advantage and advocate like is it his grades, his tests, what could they do to like make themselves stand out? I, in the think, process? I think, I think it's all of that. I think it's, uh, well, for one, I think you should, anybody that's thinking about going to the Bush school, you should go on a tour. And they have tours throughout the year. I know right now, I know they've had some tours in the last couple of weeks, which I did not sign up to be a guide this year just because of my schedule. But you should go on a tour first. Go, go on a tour. Get to kind of know the community. Um, speak to some parents. Speak to some students who are currently there. Um, and then from there, there's a, there's a, a process. And I, and I don't know the, entire, the entirety of process that you have to go through, but I'm, I know there's a bunch of paperwork you fill out. Um, you know, financial aid stuff. Uh, and I believe there's still is kind of like an aptitude test that you take. Um, but it, obviously it's going to differentiate from the lower school to the middle school to the upper school. And you all get like any kind of scholarships or like tuition assistance? Of or anything? course. Okay. Of course. Yeah. 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 And then talk about, I'm guessing there's like kind of like, like a higher chance of going to college or doing something better versus a public school or is there? I think, well, I would say that's not just for Bush. I think that's for any independent school. Any, any private school, I still call them private schools. I know they call them independent schools now, but I think for any, I can speak to the Bush school. Yes. You don't go to the Bush school to not go to a prestigious college. Right. Um, and when I went to college, you know, I applied, you know, they, they, they actually have you apply for like, I know I can get into these five schools. Right. Then there was like, okay. And then there's maybe five that nah, I might be able to get into those schools. I might not be able to get into. And then it was like, I'm just gonna apply to these because man, I always wanted to be a blue, 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 blue. 
<laughs> I just want to go to Duke because it's always been on my list. And I applied to Duke and I did not get in, which it wasn't a surprise. But most, I think the schools that I wanted to go to and I applied to, I got in. I, I remember like Pepperdine was one I got into, but Pepperdine was expensive um, at the time. And I, and I, I actually wanted to play basketball. Um, so, I, you know, having been down there for all-star camp, which my high school coach took me to, Jim Franklin, rest in peace. He was a big influence in my life. Um, Pepperdine was one of those schools, UCAL, Santa Barbara. Um, I got into, I think, University of Redlands was, an, I think those are the three California schools I applied to and got in. Um, HBCUs were big for my grandparents because my grandfather, he was from Forest, Mississippi. My grandmother was from a town called Camden, South Carolina. So the whole HBCU, which, which I didn't understand a lot then, um, but Johnson C. Smith was one of the schools that I applied to, got in. Hampton, um, there's one more I feel like I applied to. Johnson C. Smith, Hampton, maybe it was just those three, those two. Um, and I got in all those. I think Hampton was actually the first school that I was accepted into. Uh, but I wound up at a school called Eastern Oregon University, <laughs> which was probably not on a school on Bush. I'm probably the only person from the Bush school to ever attend Eastern Oregon <laughs> University. Um, so there was a coach that was recruiting me from the University of Portland, Art Furman, that I had built a relationship with. I believe his staff, the staff that he was under at University of Portland, they were fired or they left or whatever. I don't, I don't know the exact circumstances, but Art took the head coaching job at Eastern Oregon. Um, and he liked me and called me up and had a spot for me. So I wound up going to Eastern Oregon for five years. I was a redshirt freshman and, and it was the best time of my life. And I, I but to some degree, I still wish my father would have, Push me to like Johnson C. Smith, right? Like, you know, a black kid growing up in Seattle, like that is a far away place. That would have been a long way for me to go. And I just wasn't probably mentally ready at the time. But, you know, with all the craze about HBCUs now and what's going on, I wish he would have like nudged me a little harder to go. So it's time for your kids to go to school. Of course, it's like 10 years from now. And they come ask for advice. Are you going to like kind of influence to go to HBCU, pick their best choice? And is there really a difference in education between the HBCU? This called what is it called PWI? Yeah. Like, yes. Is it you know? Is it? I think black, there is. Yeah, I've heard people say if you're a black person, you go to HBCU, you get this experience, you know, all yeah. kind of stuff, you know. And, well, and again, I've, I've only visited HBCUs, and you know, some of my good friends have uh, gone to HBCUs. I have a couple of friends that have gone to Hampton. I know folks that have gone to Howard, Florida A and M, Elizabeth City. Like, the, yeah, it's a different experience. You know, like I had a great experience. You know, I was a I was a college athlete, so my experience was different than just being a normal student at um, Eastern Oregon University. But my wife would, she would definitely, she, I mean, she's already, yeah, she, they're going to an HBCU. If it's up to her, they're going to an HBCU. Um, my my oldest has often talked about, you know, wanting to go to the air, go in the Air Force because his godfather um, played football and was a student at the Air Force Academy. And that's the only way she would ever let him join the services. <laughs> like you're going to an academy, like you got to go to Air Force Academy, right? You're not just going to enlist. Um, but they already know where, like they talk about where they want to go to high school already. Like they're, 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 they're pretty smart kids and we instill education in them, pound it in their heads every day, you know, like how important education is. So they're aware of black colleges. They're aware of some of the top high schools in the city and they're already talking about it at five and eight years old. So they make a very informed choice when it comes yes. to that time. Yeah. Yes, for sure. Good. So something else you do is something called Baseball Beyond Borders. Can you talk about that? Baseball Beyond Borders is a, a organization that I've been a part of. It's a nonprofit that I've been a part of since its um, initiation, since it's been organized. Um, Buki Gates, a good friend of mine, started this organization. And it's and at the end of the day, it's a it's a it's a baseball organization, but it's a, it's a platform to teach kids really in my eyes, it's about life skills, preparing these young men um, for college and now and, and life. Right. But now there's, there's volleyball, there's softball is involved in part of the organization. So it's basically a platform to, you know, to create interest about baseball because you don't hear about a lot about baseball in the inner city. Um, and it's an expensive sport. I mean, my kids started playing t-ball and baseball this year. I remember we went to big sporting goods to get a bat for my oldest son. That was like 300, 300 bucks for a baseball bat. 
Man, I, well, he's not that bad for the rest of his life, you know. What I, mean? I mean, the gloves are like a hundred bucks. So, um, but Buki created a, an amazing organization, an amazing group of uh, board members there um, that are passionate about for one baseball and passionate about kids and seeing kids um, excel in baseball and in school and in life. And uh, yeah, so it's a really cool organization here in the city of Seattle. So I don't know the numbers, but you know, back in the day, like there's a different amount of African Americans playing baseball, right? And yep. they used to look baseball. The number was like dismally low, right? Do you think is this an idea like you know it costs too much, or do you think any factors come? Always kept back. Oh, baseball is like an old white man's game. Let's go play basketball, football is more sexy. I think because in baseball, like you can play like 42, 43, make millions of dollars. You can play baseball forever. I, I think. Baseball is just one of those sports where, again, because of its cost, the, the costs that come with baseball, you know, economically, you know, we just haven't been in a place where we've been able to go. Like, I can't just pick up a bat and go play baseball, right? You got to have a group of people to play baseball with. Versus, and you got to have like a field, right? Got to have you a field. You just yeah. can't play in the street. No. Well, I mean, you can. You can. You can. You can. I grew up playing in the streets. I mean, we would, you know, use the four corners, you know, <laughs> and and create a home plate, a sec- first, second, third base, and we would play a lot of wiffle ball in the streets. Where you know nowadays, you know, a lot of people just don't even let their kids out. I mean, it's it's a different day and age. But yeah. um, I think baseball is one of those sports. It's it's expensive. You know, there's a lot of different things that you have to have to be complete at baseball. I mean, from the from the glove to the to the to the batting gloves, to the catcher's mitts and the outfield cleats. gloves, the cleats. I mean, baseball is expensive. It's like skiing. You don't see a lot of black folks that ski, at least growing up in the inner city where I grew up. None of my friends ski. You know, I mean, you gotta have the skis, the poles, the boots, the helmet, the gear. I mean, it's it's expensive versus and you gotta get there. And you you gotta get to the mountain. And you gotta pay the lift ticket. You gotta pay the lift ticket. I mean, gas just to get to, I mean, the closest. Lift is probably what Snoqualmie Pass. I mean, that's I mean, that's no, you know, that's not a short drive. But um, so again, I, I think a lot of it's just you know, the economics behind it. But you know, when I, you know, black folks, anything we touch, <laughs> we turn to gold, man. You know, like we're we we're athletically good and engineered. Our DNA is just like we're good at whatever we touch, whether it's golf. <laughs> whether it's tennis, whether it's baseball, obviously we excel at basketball, we excel at football, but that's, those sports are sexy, right? And they have been primarily the sports where it's attainable for us. Yeah. You know, it's been attainable and you can make a whole lot of money, but you can also make a whole lot of money playing baseball too. Yeah. I mean, you can make a whole lot of money doing a lot of stuff these days. I mean, esports, you can, I mean, <laughs> it's a, it's a different day and age. I know, Kim, I know back in the day, like you play video games, your parents like, you know, what are you doing? Get outside. Yeah. Imagine how many more meetings there would be the parents who said, well, are you really good? You know, let's, let's, let me see. Oh, you're good. Oh, okay. Let me invest in this, you know? And they're giving scholarships. Like you can go to college on an esports scholarship. Like, it's just a, like I said, it's a different day and age, man. There's so many, the things that kids have at their, at the palm of their hand, obviously these tablets and smartphones. And, you know, now we're talking about that, you know, artificial intelligence. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's the, it's the, it's the new cheat code. I mean, it think is. about like when, when we were in school and if I had chat GPT, <laughs> like, I would have passed all my tests. I mean, it's just, you know, there's just so much information. And to some degree, it's overload. But, you know, like my wife is really stringent on, on my kids. Like, you still need to be able to pick up a book physically and read yeah. it, right? Everything doesn't need to be on a tablet, Red. Mm-hmm. She wants you to be able to turn the pages and read line by line, which, you know, a lot of that I... I completely understand you got to keep that mind sharp yeah. chat gpt i think it's a blessing and a curse i think too many people like or ask a question you know when did you know such and such happen and just and they're just like right answer that verbatim you still yeah. got to go there and massage it you know put your twist on it you know because like yep if everyone in the class has the same answer the, the teacher obviously knows okay 100 and you got to understand like i mean when you're putting in those you know because I've, I've tried and i've seen it and i'm like it's crazy but all it is it's just i mean again from my understanding it's just it's pulling from the cloud, yeah. the web, whatever, all, you know, whatever is, yeah. all those different platforms, right? Whatever's out there, whether it's Google, Bing, or Internet, but whatever it is, it's just pulling all that. It's just pulling from those sources, and it's just piling into whatever answer you ask or whatever question you ask. So, I mean, how reliable is it? It's not as reliable as the information that's out there. Yeah, like I say all the time, like, talking about ethics, right? 
it's not only as good as ethics person doing the original code, right? right. If that person is a piece of shit, you don't get piece of shit answers, right? 100%. Like, like, how do you control that? 100%. You don't control it. Yeah, 100%. So recently you had a, a major accomplishment where you uh, got a master's from Georgetown in sports management. That's a pretty big deal for you, right? Yeah, it, 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 you know, Georgetown was one of those schools. I actually forgot, but Georgetown was one of those schools on my list. Like I was always, you know, growing up, basketball was my thing. And, you know, at the time, you know, John Thompson was like the godfather. Like when you talked about basketball, college basketball and playing for a black coach, John Thompson was that guy. And, you know, my era, my brother and I, um, my brother EC and I like Georgetown basketball, the Hoyas. It was Hoya everything, Hoya this, Hoya that, and that gray and blue was just amazing. So again, fast forward to, you know, age 45, I think is when I decided like, you know, cause I've been battling it for years. Like, I'm gonna go back to grad school. Should I not? And again, I got my bachelor's in 1999 and, you know, um, I just finally, my wife got hers in 2013. She got her master's and I just always felt like something was missing, right, from my from my resume. And, you know, I, I I hate to always bring, like, color into it, but at the end of the day, like, we have to show up differently. Black folks, you know, males, male, black men have to show up differently, you know, and we have to look a certain way. We have to, we have to be that much tighter, and we have to have so many accolades just to sometimes get in the door, right? Um, and for me, Georgetown was very strategic. Um, I had always wanted to go there, but, you know, and again, I applied to several other programs and thought about several other schools, but I knew, you know, especially after talking to my wife and a few other people, like Georgetown is where you need to go. For one, they had everything that I was looking for in a master's program, but it's Georgetown. And did you actually go there and live there or was it remote? No. So it was supposed to be like one of those type of programs where you go out there so often, um, like an executive, like an executive MBA. Um, in sports management industry, but the pandemic hit. Yeah. So I I uh, started, I think it was 2019, like fall of 2019, and then February, boom, everything was shut down. So yeah. it was strictly an online program. I think about all the all the stuff you miss by not being in person, right? All the networking, yeah. all, all that all that extra stuff. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. It was tough, uh, especially because majority, I would say if I had to put a number on it, I would bet at least 90% of the people that were in the program were from the East Coast. So whenever we were working on group projects, I was the guy that I had to be up. Like if they were up at six o'clock, I had to be up at three o'clock, <laughs> right? Like it was just, it was hard. Like I'm not going to front. And as a, as a guy that hadn't been in school since 1999 and then to go back in 2019, man, it was, it was hard. I, me- I remember my first semester I think I took an accounting, like business, like a finance class. And I think I literally cried. And I looked at my wife. I was like, I maybe jumped the gun on this one. Like, this is, I'm not, I'm not ready. But I got through it. I got through it and it, it got easier. And then by, you know, I got spring fever by my last semester when I had to do my um, thesis. And it was just, it was tough, but I got through it went to the graduation. So I was actually on campus for, you know, the graduation ceremony. I got to meet a lot of the people that I was in, you know, part of my cohort. Um, and it was good. It was, it was cool being out there on the campus, seeing all the black folks, white folks, Asian folks, just, just seeing everybody and what it means to be a Hoya. Um, and now I'm part of that community. And my wife always talks shit about me because I'm like, you know, she's like, oh, so you're not, you're not an Eastern Oregon Mountaineer anymore. Like, you know, you don't represent Eastern Oregon I'm like, I will always represent Eastern Oregon. This is Georgetown, right? Yeah, uh, it's a little, yeah, more prestigious. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So now I just, you know, my goal is to, you know, and then actually this year, like I need to get connected with like the Black Alums Association out there um, and get, get tapped in with the sports industry management program. Cause I know there's, you know, there's probably some, some folks out there because they were a lot of people were really impressed with my resume. I was probably one of the older people in the program. Uh, but it was good. It was good. I'm I'm glad I did it. I don't have no regrets. I'm glad I did it. Yeah. A lot of people don't know this, but the army, like like if they really think you're like really good captain, like like top the top right, mm-hmm. they send you to Georgetown for two years to get a degree and stuff. I can't remember what it was. But I might be making this number up, but those people who get the master's degree from Georgetown from the army, yeah, 90% of them go ahead go to make general. Really? Yeah, it's like really like it's really like um exclusive. We really, really like yeah, but ninety percent go ahead and make general, right? That's dope. So to your program, yeah. yeah, yeah. So Georgetown's really up there. Georgetown is up there, man. Yeah, I love it. I can't wait to go back. I haven't been back on campus since I graduated last year, but 
I'm hoping to go back soon. So next one, let's suppose your kids are getting ready to go to college, right? Yep. Like throw your, like throw your curb, but like, Hey parents, like, I know you want us to go to college, but we want to do take a, like a, a year break or we want to start a business. Mm-hmm. We want to do something else. What do you think your reaction is going to be? My reaction would be cool. What's your plan? I have no, no qualms about my kids not wanting to go to school right away. Like, here's the thing. You're going to go to school or you're going to do something. Like, you're going to get a trade. You're going to, you have to do something. You're not just going to sit on your ass and be watching YouTube all day or, you know, again, it, it has to be meaningful. It has to be impactful. And when I say impactful, it has to impact their lives because this is your life. I mean, you're now a young adult and mom and dad are not going to be supporting you for the rest of your life, right? Like, so you have to, I would say the most important piece is they, they just got to have a plan, you know, but I, w- I wouldn't be opposed to that, you know. I think too many parents nowadays that you have to go to school no matter what, right? Mm-mm. And I, I don't, I'm, some people don't realize like what college has increased by 10,000 billion percent of costs, you know, like it's insane, it's right? Really expensive, man. And like, and, and what do they really do for you? You know, like, is it is college supposed to like find you a job, make you a better person, right. you know? Well, for me, I think um, being a student athlete at Eastern Oregon University, um, I, well, I, I will say I was prepped very well for college life because um, Eastern was, I mean, the Bush School was like a prep school. So our, our, our schedule was like being in college. Like I might not have a class that didn't start until 10, you know, whereas Seattle Public School back in the day, school started at 7.15 and you were at school from 7.15 till. 2.30, right? Like, you, that was your schedule versus Bush. You might have an open period here or you might not have to show up until you might only have three classes on Wednesday and four on Tuesday and Thursday, right? Like, it just, it, it, it prepared me for college. Um, but I would say college... So, so, you, so you knew not to pick a class A in the morning. 100%. 100%. As a, yeah, as a student athlete in college, I think most of my classes didn't even start until 10.30, right? Um, but I did that on purpose too, because I knew like once I got home from practice or game nights, like I wasn't studying. So my thing was I would get up at six in the morning, go to the library. I was in the library from like seven to like nine. Like that was the time I studied, did all my homework and then maybe like an hour break and then boom, I'm was to class. But I think college is more about, yeah, I mean, college is, to me it was about the experience, life skills, right? Like you meet people from all over the place. I mean, my freshman year, my roommate, I, you know, I had to stay in the dorms as a freshman. And my roommate was from a small town in, I don't even remember the town. It was some town in Oregon. We were opposites. He was from the country. I was from the city. He was white. I was black. Uh, <laughs> we dressed differently. We looked different. We talked different. But we was as cool as, cool as the fans. You know, it like, doesn't make how that works out. Together, you know, it mean? always works out like that. It works out. You never heard of like, where it's like bad case. Always like, you know, became best of friends. Yeah, or so stuff. Cool. Rand, Rand was his name. I can't remember his last name or his friend, but so cool. And, um, and again, it was just about, for me, it was about experience, trying new things. Like that's the one place where you can like just kind of explore and let loose and try a bunch of stuff without really being penalized. You know what I mean? Like I was an Eastern ambassador. I was close with Dean Stenard before he passed away, unfortunately. Um, like, I, I got involved with, I wasn't just a student athlete. Like, I made sure that I got involved and I wasn't just a jock. Because, um, again, a lot of that, the Bush School taught me. And my dad, you know, he was one of those, you know, make sure you get involved. You get involved with some of the decision makers and get to know different, different people while you're there. So it's not like you always like extra stuff, right? I know some people say, why are you doing extra stuff? Just more work. Yeah. But if you don't realize you do extra stuff, you put yourself out the more people want to deal with you more, right? Can you just talk about the benefits of doing like more? Well, I think, I mean, really what we're talking about is building relationships and networking. I mean, and again, I didn't know that's what it was called at the time, but I think really that's, that's what you're doing. You're building up a pipeline because at some point, you know, I didn't realize it, but I would need Dean Stenard. I was going to need Coach Furman. I was going to need some of my friends, you know, um, to put in a good word for me here or there. I mean, so you just start to build these relationships and you do good by people. People will support you and look out for you. I mean, that's really honestly what it, what it is. I'm, I'm going to be on a panel here in a couple of weeks at the Bush school talking about, you know, we're, we're celebrating our centennial year, um, our hundred years uh, of, of the Bush school. And I'm going to be sitting on a panel talking about mentorship and what mentorship means to me and what it should mean to other people and 
how do you gain a mentor? How do you become a mentee and all that type of stuff? I think so much of that stuff is important, which I think a lot of young folks need to hear that. Know that I, there's one phrase that I despise when I hear people say they're self-made. Well, <laughs> somebody helped you somewhere. Like I get it self-made. Like, yeah, you went out and did the work, but somebody gave you a lane, opened the door, like, you know, so. And how often times do you get help? You have no idea that you got help, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. Somebody said a word for you or someone, you know, how many times do Man, I saw me where like, you know, you're getting people discuss you in closed rooms. You're not there. And like, you have a champion there yeah. or somebody, you know, give Jason a chance, give yeah. Steve a chance. Right. And yeah, you, you don't know about it. And, and a lot of mentors won't even tell you because that's not, it's not for them to shine. It's not for them to take credit. Like when you have real mentors, they're just trying to, like you said, you have a, you have an in-house cheerleader, somebody who's an advocate for you and wants to support you and see you in at the highest level. So you took a, like, kind of like a, a career change where you became a salesperson at a, at a, a medical company. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about why you did that? I'm just, you know, like, cause that's like, how about going from, you didn't go for Apple oranges, you were like from apples or something else, right? You're like, is that something you wanted to do or just like make economic reasons? Well, it just, I mean, so I, I graduated in 1999 and I knew I wanted to work for a sports team, right? And so, from till about 2001, I worked for the Seattle Sonics. I got real close with Mr. Gary Payton. GP came like a big brother. And G was like one of my, he was like my idol, right? When it came to basketball, everything that I did, I emulated myself. Like, you know, a lot of people emulated Jordan, Kobe. Like I emulated Gary Payton. Um, and so I got to know G really well. Um, so I went and started working for his foundation. And through his foundation, I became close with Eric and Aaron Goodwin of Goodwin Sports, where I got my sports agent career started. And um, I was a big fan of Eric and Aaron, you know, and, and I knew that's what I wanted to do, right? Um, so I did that for years. And in 2010, 2010, I stepped away and started doing my own thing. I started my own company, Bank Sports Ventures, did that for a little while. Got connected to another big time agent, um, was with him for a few years. And, it was just, you know, it was one of those where I was just like, you have to, you have to, I don't want to say you have to be cutthroat to be in that industry, but you got to have tough skin. You got to have resources. You got to be built a certain way. And I'm built for it, but there's just some stuff I'm just, I'm just not going to do. Like, again, I, I, earlier you brought up the word integrity, you know, like, ethical, having morals, having certain standards for yourself. Like there's just some shit I'm just not going to do. And so I was kind of burnt out after that. Um, I took a break in 2013. Uh, then I went and worked for Morgan's, no, I went and worked at New York Life, for life insurance. And again, that was just kind of like. And that's you got the Heisman Trophy of the salespeople. I forget the name of the award, but I got a really big time award where I was honored in front of like thousands of people at uh, our president's council meeting in Miami. I um, had a lot of success there because um, I'm helping people. So it's the Ben Feeman Life Excellence Award. Yeah, if you say so, if it's in there, if it's in the bio. Yeah, it's in the bio, yeah. Um, but I wasn't in love with life insurance, right? I wasn't in love with life insurance, but I, I, I enjoyed helping people. So I, I walked away from there, went to Morgan Stanley for a little bit. That was a little too corporate for me. Um, and the thought of, you know, managing people's money, like, again, I was just in this place of what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And then that job just kind of fell into my lap. Um, one of my wife's um, sorority sisters, a really good friend of ours, um, gave me an opportunity to work with Eli Lilly in the diabetes unit. And it served its purpose. Again, I wasn't in love with being a salesperson, but I think there's two types of salespeople, right? People that actually sell and they have to sell and they have to hustle you and tell you everything about their products is golden. And there's people that, you know, can sell without selling. And I'm one of those people I, I can sell because I think, Again, I'm more concerned with like building a relationship and you want to, and you want to buy or, or you want to have something that I have because man, I, I trust what Steve is bringing me. Right. And that's the sale. I don't have to sell. Like I, I don't have to be a used car salesman to sell you a product. I, I feel like I'm good enough in relationships. I could, I could sell ice to an Eskimo um, through my conversation and, and how I approach sales, if you will. So I worked at Eli Lilly for I think two and a half or three years. And again, it served a purpose, but I wasn't in love with it. It just, it served a purpose, you know? So, you know, a, a, lot, a lot of Seattle's a big startup community. A lot of startup founders, they'll build a product, you know, code it, tech, whatever. Yep. But they suck at selling, right? Yep. Because they're, they just can't do it, right? What advice you have someone who's like 
say I'm not a good salesman, like become a good salesman? Um, that's a that's a loaded question because I I'm a fan of know what you're good at, right? And if you're not good at something, find somebody who is, right? Like, like I'm a relationship guy. Like I'm I have a partner, business partner right now who has a product which I can't speak too much on it because we haven't gone public with it. Um, but he's a he's a visionary, right? He's 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 your Steve Jobs. He's got the ideas up here. He's an innovator, but he couldn't, he, he couldn't sell ice to Eskimo. He couldn't, he couldn't sell, <laughs> sell, sell a product if you gave him the blueprint and he had it right in front of him. That's just not who he is. Right. Um, he's a, he's not a, he basically, I guess what I'm trying to say is just know your lane, know what you're good at and what you're not good at. You outsource that or you bring somebody else in to do that right like i'm not like i'm a relationship guy and i know that about myself i'm not like this what you have set up in here like the microphones and stuff, like that's not my thing like i i can't do that that this would stress me out this would stress me out like all these chords and into this and that it can't that would stress me out so i would hey jason i'm trying to do this thing i've got a relationship with these people <laughs> can you hook this up or set this up for me I, again it's just Know your lane. That's what I would tell somebody. I mean, if they really just want to get into sales, again, you've got YouTube at your beck and call. Yeah, YouTube, YouTube, YouTube University. YouTube will tell you everything, everything you need to know. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm. But again, if you're if you're a visionary, focus on being the visionary and, and building that vision, and then you hand it off. I think where people get in trouble, you know, so many people. I just went through that with a again without going too much into detail. I was working with a startup group, and I just feel like. It could have been something special, um, but egos got involved. Man, I, I don't need to be the man. Where you want to go, I've already been there. I've been to the mountaintop in the sports management space. I've been, I've been in New York. I've been in the green room several times. You know, I've had my own client in the green room. You know, and, and hearing David Stern call out their name and like that, I'm not impressed by that type of stuff anymore. And so many, so often, so pe people are in love in my business, in love with the lifestyle not necessarily in love with the work that comes behind it. Like you see the finished product and you see people sitting at the, at the gangs or you see Steve riding, you know, on a, on a private jet or, or in the Bentleys or sitting courtside at the game, but you don't see the work that goes into yeah. all that. Like it, it's, it takes time. And I think this newer generation or a lot of, a lot of these new agents in the game, they're so in love with the lifestyle. And it's tainted it. Being the VIP at three in the morning, yeah. the, the yeah. entourage. You know, they just, they, they you know, the team. Yeah, they want to be, you know, they, they want people to, man, this is mine. I did this. I, and you can have all that shit. I don't care about that. Like, as long as I can go home back to my wife and kids at the end of the night. And again, I don't just, I want to be able to provide. Cause I, if I was in it for the money, I would have quit a long time ago. I'm not a millionaire because I struck it big in the sports management space. I, I truly enjoy what I do now, I will say my time is here. Like God is aligning a lot of stars. And over the last couple of years, I've been courted by some bigger agencies. I have an opportunity to do my own thing. Now I've got options and choices. And I've at 48, I have the right people around me to make sure that I'm successful. So if you could go back in your life, like your 19th grade or whatever, pick any age, do you think you would have been where you are right now? Like you, if your 10th grade self man, like Steve, man, you like really made it, or like, do you think you haven't done it enough? Or, um, I would say, <laughs> I would say no, I have not made it. Now, other people will look at me and be like, you know, dude, you're so successful. You, man, you made it. You this, you that, and and I'm I'm flattered by that. And and to some regards, yeah, I, I think I've accomplished everything that I've set out to do. But I think there's something out there bigger that God wants me to have or make a bigger impact in this space because i've tried to walk away from sports on several occasions and he reels me back in every time i've walked away from this industry i've tried to walk away and opportunities just continue to come my way and so i'm blessed i mean literally i'm blessed i know some of the biggest names in this industry i know some of the biggest players in this industry um personal relationships with guys that um, you know, they're the competition, but we can rock together. You know, one of my mentors, you know, he's from Atlanta. We, we met 
Well, he's from Detroit, but he lives in Atlanta. We met because we were recruiting the same dude. And I remember his company wound up getting this particular client. But there was a, there was a, and he's a brother, he's a black guy, but there was a certain amount of love and respect there. Like I called him the night of the draft, text him. I think I might, it's either call or text him, but just to say, man, congratulations. Ain't no hate. Ain't no, cause you hear a lot of that stuff in this industry where, when I think earlier I mentioned that black on black crime, like when people will hate on you and hate on this person and then uh, I'm not in all that. I'm, you won. My, that just means my time is coming. Like you got it. Like I, I support. You know, I just wish we could collaborate more. But that's not that's not the nature of this because there's that's not the nature of the business because there's so much money at stake. But isn't it crazy how so many people think that like, everything is limited, right? There's a limited piece of pot of money when it's actually yeah. like expansive, and the more you make, the more other people make. I mean, to some degree. I mean, to some degree, but there's a lot of money in this industry. There's a, lot, there's a lot of opportunity to make money. And nowadays, I think, I mean, I think, I don't know if you saw, but Giannis. Yeah, I saw that. He just signed a three-year deal for, I think, $186 million. I think that averages out to like $62 million a year. And he's a superstar. And there are guys, there are guys at the end of the bench making $60 million. Like, the, I'm talking like the, the ninth, 10th, 11th guy at the end of the bench. That's still a lot of money. Because yeah. I remember when that was the norm. When guys were just making that amount. So I say that to say, you, everybody's not going to get a Giannis. Everybody's not going to have a LeBron. Everybody's not going to have a Steph. Everybody's not going to have a Jason Tatum. You know, like you can have a, a, a guy that is loyal, that, that believes in you, and that is looking for the, the small agent. You know, some guys want the, want the glitz and the glam. That's cool. There's a, there's a spot for everybody in this industry. And so for me, I mean, you know, if, if I'm blessed enough to get a, a, a big name guy, a, a, a lottery pick, that just means God had it in my plans. If I don't like there's, there's low hanging fruit out there and there's guys that need a Steve Banks in their life. And I'm Definitely. cool with that too. Right. Like, so, like I said, like whether it's 50 million or it's 200 million, that either way, 4% of either one of those numbers is a lot of money. Yeah. You know what I mean? The one thing, I don't think people realize how good NBA players are because there was a thing on TV a while ago where this player, I can't remember his name, the white guy, mm-hmm. used to play the Boston Celtics. He's always like the 12th guy on the bench, right? Mm-hmm. And people are like going after, like, you know, you're, you're a star player or whatever. And so you challenge people, like, playing me in the game, right? Mm-hmm. He played all these intramural people, junior college people. He, he, he like, slaughtered all of them. Like, he, like, 21 or nothing. Right. I think it was Scarbini, something like that. Scarabini. Yeah, that's yeah. it, yeah. yeah. I mean, he does all of them. Like, combined, so, like, 113 to 2, right? Because he don't look like, I mean, he don't, he don't look like a hooper, but he's good. I mean, and, and, and he was like, I'm closer to LeBron than you are to me. Facts. Yeah. That's a real, that's, <laughs> that is a real, real statement. And you have to be good to get to the NBA. Yeah. You have to be good to get overseas. You have to be good to go to college. Yeah. You have to be at some level. You have had to been good for the coach or an organization to say, that's the guy we want in our program. Yeah. You know? So and taking more talent, right? That you guys, so you're a good worker, good character, you know. Yeah, yeah. And so many guys don't pay attention to that. I mean, when you start talking about like building brands and you want to be the next LeBron, right? Like my son, he is enamored with LeBron, and I'm like, well, you don't ever want to go to the gym. Like LeBron been working at this for a long time. It didn't. I mean, now he's got some physical attributes, right? Like his DNA. Yeah. You know, his mom and his daddy, they, they created this uh, uh, unicorn, but what he does off the court and how he takes care of his body, like, yeah, he puts in the work, right? Like, that's, that's the difference between, you know, I've seen it, the elite and then the middle tier and the guys that are just, man, they just happy to be here. Yeah. They get that check and they get that 30 million, 40 million, 50 million, and they're good. Then there's the guys that are the 200 million guys. Those guys stay in the gym. They understand that they have to strike while the iron is hot, and they understand the harnessing of their opportunity while they have it, because the opportunity is not always going to be there. No, and doesn't LeBron like like spend like a million dollars on the body every year or something like that? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure like didn't I'm sure like didn't do it back in the day, but now right. it's like all the education out there, you know. For sure. But why not? You know, like I mean, of course you can afford it, and it's like making your your career lasts longer right which is why he's in the conversation I mean, michael jordan or LeBron. yeah like that, i mean he's like 38 averaging 30 of game you know like he's still one of the best still doing it at a level right now it's insane the stuff he can do dude it's physical. i mean he looks like lebron looks like he can get on the football field right now oh, and yeah, get somebody definitely or, light somebody up yeah 
I wouldn't go up against him. <laughs> <laughs> Not me. <laughs> yeah. So you talk about branding. Talk about, you know, especially now with the, uh, things called name members of likeness and college sports, the importance mm-hmm. of like college athletes knowing the points of branding, even at a, now versus, you know, mm-hmm. I think Deion said the most famous one, like, I, I think the story is like a, uh, an agent showed him the, um, the salary for cornerbacks. He said, oh, I can't have this. He started like branding himself, doing prime stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. You're talking about the points like athletes, maybe not to an extent, but like, okay, this is your name and likeness. You need to, you know, make yourself worth something, so to speak. Um. The name, image, and likeness, for me, like, I'm not an expert in the name, image, and likeness. So I want to I wanna put that PSA out there right now. Um, I love the fact that these athletes, these college athletes, and even in some states, high school athletes can get paid off of their name, right? I love that. But unfortunately, I think the NCAA <laughs> jumped the gun too fast. And when I say they jumped the gun too fast, I think, there weren't parameters around what, what that means, how I can use my name. And um, I just, it's, it's just wide open, right? Now, some people like are, are really winning. Um, I will go to Angel Reese. Angel Reese, who plays for LSU, won the national championship. She's killing it. She's killing it in the NIL space. I think the last, thing I saw, she was like, her NIL valuation was like a $3 million. If I'm Angel Reese, why? I'm not going to the WNBA. The WNBA is going to be there. Like, she's making so much money right now, she probably, I mean, she don't need to go to the WNBA. Yeah, her and uh, the other lady, um, the rapper lady, I can't see any of them. Yeah, they, they yeah. interviewed it. They, like, they said, why go to NBA? Like, they're messed up. They're not doing this. Like, all this stuff's going on. Like, I'm getting paid. I have a great coach. I'm, in college, I'm living the life. Um, mm-hmm. and so that she just, I know Alan Everson and Shaq, they're reigniting like Reebok basketball. She's now the face of Reebok basketball, okay. which again, amazing. Like, I love that for her. But where, where the NFL space gets tricky, everybody's not eating like her. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, the quarterback at Alabama, he's probably eating. Mm-hmm. Uh, Michael Penix Jr. at UW, he's eating. Shador Sanders, he's eating. Yeah. The average guy is not eating like that. But the backup defensive tackle for North Dakota State, he's not eating. Though. Like he, like yeah, you might get some local deal from like an auto tech shop or something. You know, you're you're absolutely right. And but you know, the one thing that I like the NIL space. Some some kids are really on that. So we're we're in battle with the NIL space is college coaches and college programs now, in some degree. In some regard, they have the capability to do exactly what they've always been frustrated with sports agents, sports managers, like how we recruit. Like you offer people money, you offer a kid money. Now it's no secret. Some people play that game, but now all of a sudden it's legal. That's, I mean, kids are now going to the highest bidder. Well, Notre Dame's offering me 50,000, Texas is offering me 70,000. Well, Alabama, what you offering? Well, we're coming with the bag. We got 100. Remember the case in that quarterback from Arizona had a, was going to first go to Florida and then Florida backed off. Like they cut the NIL deal in half. He said, yeah. okay, I'm going somewhere else. And since you're, you know, you know, crazy. Yeah. Crazy. And, and, and a lot of the, and a lot of this stuff, again, a lot of it is just not even NIL deals. It's just, man, we got a bag for you. Come here. We'll find something. I know Texas Tech have a deal. It's called, it's called, but basically like it's a foundation on the guys at NIL where they pay all the athletes. Like twenty thousand a month. And write these collected. Yeah, collect, yeah, collect, yeah. Not 20, yep. It's like not twenty thousand 20, a year. They pay everyone yep. the same amount of collector, right? To me, that's not NIL, right? That's right. like paying your players, right? But it's what it is. Right? I like that model, right? It's a, it's a, it's, it's a fair limit. Right? It's a football player, it's football player, player. Yeah. whatever. Versus ain't nobody eating like Michael Penix Jr. at no. UW, like you know. And again, that again, I don't, I'm not making it. I just think at some point they're going to have to put some parameters around the NFL space and yeah. how guys went. I just, and I, you know, I also hope that these kids are getting education on the financial side of it. Yeah. Right? Cause a lot exactly. of these kids understand taxes and like, this is some of the stuff with some of these guys, it's putting you in a tax bracket that, yeah. that, that 1.5 million is really more like 700,000 or 800,000. You know what I mean? So I, I hope guys are getting that financial piece as well. Yeah. Good. That's I- a part of it. It was a school, I can't remember what it was, but the school they gave well a local. I think it's a Dodge Ram. They all get Dodge Rams, right? Was that Utah? Was it Utah? I think it's Utah. Yeah, I saw that. Where they is it, and uh, 
Oh, we, they were like, just you know, they're giving the cards at least, right? Yeah. But still, you know, I'm sure there's some financial implication even having a free gift card, right? Of course. We I don't know they are, but I mean, <laughs> it, it's all money is involved one way or another. So there are, I'm, I'm sure there's some financial implications. Yeah. But the fact that like, these kids have to grow up really fast now, right? At 18, 19, okay, what are taxes? What is this? What is that, right? Mm -hmm. Where before, you just, you know, go play football, so to speak, right? You get your scholarship, you get a meal card, and you're good. Everything's taken care of now, you know. And, you know, I think you have predators that, oh yeah, because of social media, it's so easy to just, you just tap into somebody's DM and you make connection with them, right? Hey, I got such and such over here. I want to deal, I'll do a deal with you. And again, I just hope that, you know, within these institutions that they're, they're prepping these kids, which I'm sure they are. Yeah. Hey, if somebody reaches out to you, bring the deal to us, let us vet it. Yeah. Give it to your parents. Somebody needs to vet it. Don't, don't get yourself in a world of trouble. Yeah. I'm waiting for somebody to sign like a deal with a cannabis company. Yeah. You know, at some point or a, it's or, a, or, or, or a strip club or porn film industry, you know, at some point it will happen or if somebody, yeah, a whiskey distillery, like, Hey, At some point, it will happen. Uh, actually, I was surprised no one from the University of Kentucky Louvre hasn't signed a deal with a bourbon company. Well, I would imagine they probably got, you know, that's a, a well-established university, and I would imagine it's a well-oiled machine. So yeah. they they know, and those kids that go to that school know, hey, you better not, <laughs> or else you'll lose your scholarship, right? I, I know two ideals I really like was the one. Uh, you, so I know you know the Cavendor twins, right? The white female basketball players. They played at uh, Fresno State. And I mean, maybe, beautiful, yeah. beautiful girls. And they, yes, yes, yes. Like, you know, take a follower, so they like yeah. transfer the ivory like that. Yeah. And then there's a way back in the day, this black kid, he became a meme for Popeyes, right? Mm -hmm. And so he's a, he plays from some like division three school and someone put on a Twitter at Popeyes, if you don't give this kid an idea, we're never eating chicken again. Within days they saw it and they gave value, like, I gave like any idea. <laughs> you know, I just sent it to you, right? It was, like, it was so great, right? It's crazy. He's like 19 years old, he's like, a Popeye's meme, you know. Yeah. He has this like funny face of Popeye's like what I look like if I don't eat Popeye. <laughs> and years later he got any idea from them, right? I mean, you know, a lot of it that I mean that's how a lot of this stuff is happening. I mean, you know, there's there's no blueprint. Here's that's what I say because I mean I well let me rephrase that. There's a blueprint and there's companies that do marketing and they have all these processes that they do. But again, because of social media and these young kids, how they stay on TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat. Like, if I want to get to a kid, I'll just go on his DM. Yeah. So yeah, hey, what's the deal with you? Uh, yeah. Here's what the deal is, and you know they can say yeah or no. They can respond. They can't respond. But it's not like the 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 days when I was you know younger. Like you dealt with somebody in the basketball division at Nike, and you and there were channels that you had to go through to get to the decision makers. It's it's a different it's a different day and age, man. Yeah, it's here's one for age. you. So the the current Texas quarterback, Brent Evers, I think is how you say his name, right? Mm -hmm. So NIL came out. He was, he was like an All American high school football player, junior quarterback in Texas. He got offered an NIL deal, but in mm -hmm. Texas you can't be a high school athlete and get an NIL deal. Yeah. So he graduated, which Ohio State a year early, got the bag from the Texas company, and then a year later transferred to Texas. Manipulating the loopholes, man. Yep. I mean. Yep. Again, there, there's see this, but that's that's what I'm talking about. The, like where the NCAA doesn't have, they don't have good parameters around this stuff. And if if you have a lot of money like that on the line, I can't say that I wouldn't make sure my wife and my kids. Hey, we need to move so we can. There's a loophole. We need yeah. to we need to get this bag. I mean, especially with uh, you know with with our population of kids. A lot of these kids come from inner cities, broken homes. You know, dad might be locked up or mom might be locked up or dad or vice versa. They live in with grandma and they, they need the money. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to make the kid from taking the money. I just want to make sure that they're getting some education around it yeah. and that these schools like have, like they're having the Morgan Stanleys come and speak to them, the Bank of America's. And a lot of kids get to school, they don't even know how to sign a check. Yeah. They don't even know how to deposit or withdraw. They don't, they don't even know what a debit card is, right? So. You can easily abuse that money. I mean, we've seen guys in the NBA, Antoine Walker. I mean, he's kind of like the poster child. Antoine Walker went bankrupt and lost a hundred million dollars. Insane. And I, and again, I got to know Antoine a little bit when I was working with GP, and because they won the title in two thousand six with the Miami Heat. I can see why guys go broke. I'm not saying him in particular, but 
I think within like, I was there for six days. I think I maybe saw Twan drive at least seven, eight different cars. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like in a, in, in six and days. I, and I'm pretty sure it wasn't a Ford Focus. No, I wouldn't know Kia Sophia's. <laughs> Maybachs and Benzes and uh, yeah, man, it's, it's crazy. So I, I, so if he can lose a hundred million, a kid can surely blow fifty thousand. Yeah, easily like that. You know what I mean? Million dollars. What do you think? Because and you have all these people talking about you know the only enough of money. Well, you know what do you think, right? But you have these coaches that make all this money, schools making millions of dollars, and you can, like criticize these kids for like you know chasing money, so to speak, right? Everyone, like Deion Sanders said, everyone's chasing the bag, right? I mean, I mean, all these conference Washington, Oregon going to Big Ten. Then I'm going because well, I just don't like the Pac Ten anymore. The no. Pac Twelve, they chasing their money. Yep. That's okay. Kind of like I said. But you money. criticize the kids when they want to get a deal. Yeah, because the scholarship is enough. That should be enough. There's a lot of people that think that they're getting free but room and board, and that should be enough. But why? They're the ones again out here on the front lines. You know, blood, sweat, and tears playing. You come into the stadium to see them. You ain't coming to see the coach. Oh, no. You're not coming to see Nick Saban. You're not even coming to, well, I guess in Colorado, you might be coming to see Dion. <laughs> <laughs> but eventually that will wear off, right? Like you want to you see the program and you want to see these young men and women in these, in, in these different positions and, and in these different sports. You want to see them excel. So I'm not opposed to it, man. I just, you know, at some point it's, you know, you know, I'm not the only one that thinks this. There's a lot of people that, it gets out of control because and there's so many different platforms and everybody's talking nil but if you you can ask you could ask 10 people the same question about nil and you'll get 10 different answers so to me that's and the rules have always been insane right i think didn't uh, the coast from michigan get suspended because he bought somewhere in hamburg or something or something like that yeah mm -hmm. but, and, but then that but that's where it gets tricky because the state laws are different yeah you know the state laws are different i mean and if i'm a kid and I know that I can't go, like, if I'm in, let's say, Alabama, let's say, I, well, Georgia, I, and I don't remember the exact law, but I know there was, like, some law in Georgia that you can only make so much money, and then if you made a certain amount, you had to give a portion back to the state. So, it was something crazy, and I could be wrong in how I'm explaining it, but if you have to look at, I mean, it's a business. So, you, as a kid, I got to look at, like, if I can make, man, I love Ohio State, man, but I can't even get an NIL deal at Ohio State. So I'm going to go over here. I'm going to go to uh, USC. So I, I know I can make the money over there. I mean, it's just, there's just so many different things that, again, you said these kids got to grow up fast yeah. and they have to make the right business decisions and they don't always make the right business decisions. And now I think it's the waters have even gotten more muddier with adding this NIL space because kids are not necessarily going to the schools for the right reason. They're yeah. going for that bag. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm not knocking them. I get it. Do I go to this school for fifty thousand, or do I go over here for two hundred and fifty thousand? Yeah. I'm going. I'm going to go, I might because I might not make it to the league. I might not make it to the next level. Like, but I can go secure this, is this right now. Two fifty is a lot of money. Regardless, it's a lot of money, man. That's a lot of money. Regardless, freshman in college, <laughs> that is a lot of money. I mean, uh, every day I go on Dion. You know, I get his alerts on my Facebook page, and every day somebody's showing up to the University of Colorado with. A new diamond necklace. Yeah. They got the. I've seen him hitting his whole thing. They're eating off the Kentucky Fried Chicken commercials. He's still doing the Aflac commercial. Yeah. I mean, they're winning. I mean, I yeah. get it. I, I get it. It's it's awesome. But I, the reality is, everybody's not eating like Shador. Everybody's yeah. not. So I think there's this misconception that if I go to college, I'm gonna eat. You know, because some, you know, I I I get that question. Well, man, well, if you represent me, you know, are you gonna be able to get us an NIL deal? What's more important, just getting you a random NIL deal or working on your craft so you can get to the next level? Yeah. Because while you're here, I don't think you should be focused on an NIL deal because ultimately you told me you want to get to the league. You want to yeah. get to the NBA. Well, be the best player so you can be in that lottery next year or be a first rounder and get some guaranteed money. You ain't going to be thinking about no NIL deal in, in a year from now. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's murky. Murky uh, waters. I always say, like, if back in the day they would just give all these players, like, maybe 1000 a month, 5000 a month, and I deal, and I will never have them right. Like, just give them $1,000, $2,000, enough money to spend money, some mm -hmm. money to take out the 
whatever your case may be, mm-hmm. but they didn't want to do it. And now it's like you said, it's like a wild, wild west now. And then proceeds, a lot of it started with, if I, if my, if I, my recollection started with um, Ed O'Bannon. Yeah, with that's, the college basketball game. Yeah, yeah. on EA Sports, right? Sports, I remember right? that. I remember that lawsuit he did. Yeah. It's football games, right? Like. Using these players' numbers, but they're not putting their names on the back of the jersey. You know who it is. You know who it is. Like yeah. you go to any now, you might see some names on the jerseys. But like my little my little bro Isaiah Thomas, they were selling his jersey. Like I have his jersey. I have a couple of his jerseys that I had him sign from New York when he went to University of Washington. But it's his jersey, but it ain't his name on the jer- on the back of the jersey. But you know it's his jersey, yeah. right? So it's just and he didn't he wasn't eating off of that. I mean, you think about like some of these guys like the money that they could have made back. I mean, GP and I talk about that all the time. <laughs> it's like, but but on the flip side, he's like, man, I'm glad social media wasn't around when I was in college and playing, you know. Yeah, I see that. Right? Like, yeah. But it's, just, you know, it's a given. It's a, I mean, it's a think, you know, like, too. obviously, Deion Sanders, like, been, like, big money. Someone like Brian Bosworth, linebacker from Oklahoma. Huge like, money. He got huge money. Maybe huge right? money. Like, the show, like, Terrell Owens, like, the guys showmanship and all yeah. that, they would have been eating. Think, think the any ideal for the, like the 1987 University of Miami football team. Wow. It would have been insane. They would have banned NIL if like they would have given that. <laughs> <laughs> they would have banned NIL, but to you, yeah, you're right. Because I was a fan of the Miami Hurricanes back in the day. Yeah, like, I mean, they, yeah. they were the team, right? The swagger, Crazy. the way they beat you down. And all them do. Oh, my God. Michael yeah. Irvin, you Michael know, Irvin, the way yeah. they were so boated, yeah. Yeah, it would have been crazy. NIL would have been off the chain. Here's one for you. Put your sports agent hat on, right? Okay. So Kelly Williams supposedly he's talking about staying the staying in college another year because he doesn't want to play for Arizona or Chicago, right? Because they're bad organizations. You said Caleb, uh, USC. Yeah, I mean he's okay. his dad saying right. Okay. And like people on TV say, "Wow, that's dumb because that delays you getting the big money mm-hmm. like, down the road." What would you tell someone like Kelly Williams? It's hard to tell him not to go. I mean, honestly, again, it, it, this situation is like it's like Angel Reese, right? And I would say he's in even a, a, not necessarily a better situation, but this guy's in L.A. As a coach that likes him, the coach get along, you know, he's a good system. In TV every, every Saturday. He's in L.A. He's a Heisman Trophy winner. Like, he's making good money. <laughs> like, why leave and go to, like, a downtrodden organization where you know your career is probably get destroyed? Right. And, and, but, but here's my thing. It's his choice. Yeah. And, and, and he has a choice now. He has a choice. Like, he don't have to Ten years ago, he would have had to come out. But now he don't have to. He does not have to come out. And I think this is where I think sports, a lot of these, a lot of the decision makers, the people with the bag, with the money, they don't like that these athletes have a voice now. They really don't. Um, I think we saw that during, you know, a lot of that inequalities and injustices going on, you know, with the, you know, the uh, George Floyd stuff and, I, I don't remember the lady that said it, but she basically was telling LeBron and those guys to shut their mouth and just stick to uh, basketball. I, I, yeah, uh, something like this. Well, she's like, like a, that, yeah. yeah, a senator or governor or something like that. She was a, a, one of the Fox News anchor lady. Yes, I, yes. I think I remember her name, but I know, I know exactly yeah, what you're talking about. Like, you know, we got voices now. Like, these dudes, hey, hey man, I'm, I'm going to stay in school because the Arizona Cardinals are crap. Mm-hmm. Like, why would I go there when I could stay in school another year? I'm in L.A. I know we're going to be playing some big games. We're probably, you know, on the verge of, you know, at least have an uh, opportunity to get to the playoffs every year. I'm not leaving. So, I, I mean, it, I would just tell a kid and his family, let's do our due diligence. If I'm representing any kid, let's do our due diligence. Let's, let's, let's talk to the decision makers. Let's talk to the NCAA. Let's see where you're at on the draft boards. And if it makes sense, like at the end of the day, you got to make a plan. You got to have a plan. I think you got to have a plan A, B, and C. Right. And, and what that consists of, that can be, consist of a variety of things, but it has to fit within your bucket and where you're trying to go and what your end result is. Right. Like, obviously, Caleb Williams is one of the top guys, um, you know, in college football, but he's going to, he has to weigh like all the, the guys coming behind him, yeah. like where those guys stand and, and where yeah. they stand on the draft boards. And so he, and there, and, and there is an injury risk, right? That's right? But again, now you can buy you can buy uh, insurance, you know, you can insure your body. So if you do get hurt and where your value would have been, you could probably potentially still get paid out that money. I mean, there's just it's, 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 what we're talking about, Jason, 
it all stems around money. Yeah. It all comes back to money. So, you know. So back to the Gary Payne Foundation. That like that's just like a like a nonprofit he, that you ran for. A nonprofit or? that I ran for GP. Yep. When he was here in Seattle, um, one of our big, uh, we worked with the Boys and Girls Club, the Rotary Boys and Girls Club here in Seattle. Gary was a big part of that. Um, big brothers, big sisters. They were one of our uh, benefactors. We did a lot of stuff with them. Um, my favorite was probably the Ronald McDonald House. My um, colleague at the time, Stephanie Ardell, we uh, created an event um, that we did at FAO Schwartz titled How the Glove Gave Christmas instead of How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Um, so we had these dope t-shirts made, but that was probably my favorite event um, because, of, because it was the Ronald McDonald House and a lot of those kids don't get to leave the Ronald McDonald House or they have cancer. They're battling something, which is why they're staying at the Ronald McDonald House, which is if I'm, if it's still there, it was right by Children's Hospital. Um, so that was probably my favorite event, getting these kids bust in from the Ronald McDonald House and going to FAO Schwartz, which was where was it Nike, no, it was where, it was Kitty Corner for where Nike Town used to be in downtown Seattle. And Gary, just let them go in there, get what you want. I mean, so, I mean, it was literally, we walked in and each kid got like a hundred dollar gift card. But by the time they got up to the cash register, they need batteries, they need this. And yeah. G just at one point, I remember he was just like, Man, everybody get what you want. <laughs> so, I mean, but that's who he is. Yeah. You know, that, that's who he is. And, you know, um, that was the heyday. That's back when Seattle, obviously, we still had a team then. Yeah. And um, Gary was in the prime of his career. I, 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 I often tell people, and people probably still feel it, the town, as much as I like, like loved Ray Allen being here in Seattle, the, the town has not been the same since the Sonics traded, right? Or traded GP to Milwaukee yeah. and Ray Allen to the Sonics. Yeah. Like that, I think that's when Seattle lost a little bit of its soul because guys like, guys have not been in the community like when Gary was in the community. Like I could be driving down 23rd and Union or 23rd and uh, Union or just driving down 23rd. And you see Gary on the block at Earl's Barbershop, just hanging out, just kicking it. You know what I mean? That, like that's who GP was. G always wanted to be with the people. I, yeah. I could remember being out with him on several occasions. G did not want to be behind no velvet rope in VIP. <laughs> Man, I want to go mingle with the people. Yeah. That's just who he was, right? I think a guy like King Griffey, I remember being young and King Griffey being in the community, Nate McMillan. Like, if, like outside of like Bobby Wagner and maybe Ty Lockett and DK, I wouldn't know any of these Seahawks because they're, they're, they're not vested in the community. Did they come here for five, six months to do their job, and then they bounce. Yeah. Like Sherm and Cam, I know they just opened up a restaurant. So you see them more often. Sydney Rice, I've gotten to know Sydney a little bit over the last year or so, but most of these guys, they're just not destined in the community. So G's foundation was a staple in the community, right? And it's I still mean, going on? He still has that foundation? He still has the foundation, but I, it's, not, it's not registered here in the state of Washington okay. anymore. I think he's, so home for him now is Las Vegas and Oakland because he's coaching college basketball in Oakland. And I know he has a home in Las Vegas as well. So okay, yeah. So this is on your bio, right? Um, and this is this is something you said: being able to incorporate my values, standards, morals into my work are what truly drives me to lead. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about what that means to you? You know, something I say to my kids every morning before I drop them off, like like every morning. One of the vice principals from last year used to say, "I'm going to steal that from you, Steve." I always ask my kids, "Where do you lead from?" They say the front. So do you leave from the back? Nope. Do you leave from the side? No, dad. You leave from the top. So I try and throw them off a little bit and then think about it. Well, yeah, you can leave from the top, but isn't that like the front? I'm like, yep. Where do you leave from the front? And so my way, you know, as a sports agent or sports manager or just somebody like in general, like my way is not always sexy. Um, and, and I will say to some degree, I maybe even get myself in trouble sometimes because I speak too transparent and I tell too much of the truth. And, and that's one of the, and again, I'm, I know I'm not perfect. That's one of the things I need to work on, especially, you know, with this younger generation, you can't give them too much. Like you can, you, one of these kids might crawl on you if you tell them too much of the real, right? Um, but I think a lot of that just stems from how I was raised. I was raised to speak the truth. I was raised to, you don't have to kiss nobody's ass to get ahead in life, um, work hard, work hard, you know, harness your relationships, 
always be good to people. Don't burn bridges. So that's when, when we talk about leadership and, you know, like having morals and standards, like there's some stuff in, in this space in particular, excuse me, as a sports manager or, you know, in the agent space, there's just some stuff I'm not willing to do. That some people are, and, and I don't knock them for that. I'm just not like, like there's two sides. It's black and it's white. And I'm not talking about race. I'm just like there's, there's, there's right and wrong. We'll use that. Then there's that questionable. I might get close to that questionable, but I'm never going to jump over that questionable line, right? Like, I think in, in this space and in, in, in life and in business in general, you have to push the limit sometimes, right? You know, it's, it's, it's competitive out here. What are you willing to do and what are you not willing to do? And I think sometimes when, when people step over that line, that speaks more about their character. And is that who you want to be? A, like, if I'm, if I'm a client and somebody's recruiting me, recruiting me, they're willing to cheat or whether, or they're willing to do something dirty or something that's not ethical, that's who you want representing you, or that's, you know, when I'm talking to parents, that's who you want your kid around. Because once you start that, like, even that, it's hard to keep that, that up. So for me, I would rather be very transparent out the gate. And I realize that I may lose some clients or, or the, lose some potential clients, right? I'm not, I'm not going to get everybody. I'm not everybody's cup of tea. And I'm okay with that. Like, there was a time where I, would, I was chasing everybody. I was trying to get everybody out. As I've gotten older, man, it's 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 not that serious, man. I want to work with good people. I want to, excuse me, I want to be surrounded by good people. I want I want to be able to hold people accountable. I want people to be able to hold me accountable. I don't. I'm I'm quick to tell you, I don't know everything, but what I don't know, I'll go find it and figure it out. Um, and I like this, and I don't ever want to be the smartest guy in the room. I don't want to ever. I don't want to be the dumbest in the room. <laughs> Excuse me. I don't want to be the dumbest in the room. But I want to be this the water for you. For you. Oh, yeah, let me get that. I had a little tickle in my throat. But um, yeah, I man. I think leadership, and you can lead. I'm, I'm, I'm a firm believer. You can lead without being the loudest in the room. I prefer to be in the background. Like in some regards, there's a lot of people that probably think that I've fallen off or. I wouldn't even say falling off, but, you know, just maybe I'm not in the business anymore or, you know, they don't know what I'm doing. And I prefer it that way. I'm, I'm Jamal Crawford, who's like my little brother, my guy. Jamal always calls me like the silent assassin because I'm, I'm quiet. You don't know what I'm doing, you know? And I was always taught, I mean, you got to watch out for them quiet ones. Yeah. You never know what they're doing, what they're thinking. And I'm always, I've got my hands in 50 million pots. And I'm always connected to the movers and the shakers, whether it's in Seattle, whether it's other places. Like I don't, and again, I don't talk about a lot of stuff that I do because I, I believe, and this is where I, I, I shift a little bit on you. I believe in the, the power of the law of attraction. I believe in manifestation. I believe in visualization. And I believe that you can prematurely put stuff out into the atmosphere. Um, and I move when God tells me to move. I put it out there when he tells me to put it out there. So I, I don't, I don't like to tell everybody my information because I know there's, I know I have an enemy. Well, I shouldn't even say enemies. Well, every, everyone's not on your team, right? Everyone's on your team. Everybody's not rooting for you. And I'd be damned if I give them the recipe. So you, you can see it when it comes out or, you know, or not. And it, I, I, I've often been told, Miss Steve, you're too nice. You're too nice. This be, I mean, how, you can't succeed in this business. You're too nice. I haven't even heard that from my wife. And I, yeah, you're right. I'm nice. But there's a space for the nice guy in this industry. I don't think you got to be an asshole to be in this industry. I don't think you have to be dirty and grimy to be in this industry. It's just gotten a dirty and grimy name because there's a lot of dirty and grimy people in the business. So talk about this, right? So uh, Steven Jackson, this former NBA player, he has a podcast. There's like three or four people on the panel, right? Mm -hmm. I saw a clip the other day where they're talking about um, – where when black athletes make it, you know, so-called make it, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they have to pay it back for it. They have to take care of their parents, their, you know, their sisters, buy my house, my cars. Mm -hmm. Where white athletes, they pay it forward, right? And they talk about how that whole thing, like, you know, it's, it's kind of wrong. Like, you shouldn't have to take care of your parents, right? Mm -hmm. Or pay it back. Can you talk about that difference? Or is, or is that even a thing? I don't know. I don't, I don't know if that's a thing. Um, I don't know if that's a thing. That's interesting. I mean, I think I think in black families, I I think that there is some expectation 
maybe it is a thing. I think there's some expectation that, you know, black families feel like, you know, because everybody's trying to get out the hood, you know? And then there's some, some, I know some black families that like, they want what's best for their kids. And they're not, they're not looking for a handout from their kids, right? And then, our, and then there are some that they expect, like when, when my son signs that big check or when my daughter signs that big check, yeah, man, I need my cut. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong. I, I think, I think, I just think there needs to be more discussion yeah. within the family. Like, hey, you're going to probably come into a lot of money and before you get this money, let's talk about what that looks like. Yeah. Like that, to me, that's, that's a family thing. Like that, that stuff needs to be discussed behind closed doors. It's like it might put like undue pressure on, on the athlete, right? Yeah. Like if this is his job, like why do I now have to kick you back just because, and, and to me, it's all relative. Like if your job, dad, like you work at the steel mill, I wasn't expecting you to kick me back because you work at the steel mill. Like you owe me some of your money every, like you were putting the food on the table. You were doing this, you were doing that. Like, because you're my dad. Now me as the child, you put me in a situation to better myself. Right? Like, why do I owe you for that? That's what you're supposed to do. You saw I had a talent. You had me in the gym or you had me on the field. You had me in the baseball diamond, working out, doing this, doing that. And you put me with the best trainers because you saw something in me. And I told you dad, this is what I want to do when I get older. I want to be a basketball player. So you, tried your best to provide me with the best and it worked out. Why do I now owe you for that? Like, so I can, I can see where the clash can be, but I think, I think a lot of that stuff just needs to be discussed and hashed out behind closed doors. And yeah. so often it's not. And then, you know, you hear about guys not taking care of their boy or yeah. whatever. It, it, it can get messy real quick because we, we, we too focused on money. Again, we come back to it. It's always about money. But like I can't remember what it was like some rapper, I can't remember his name, but like his his young sister, little sister got graduated from high school. Uh -huh. He bought a Toyota Camry. He got slammed. Like when I buying like a fancy car, like buying a Benz and like he was like, What are you kidding me, right? And I and bought a Toyota Camry 2021, you know, like, are you kidding me right now? And he got destroyed on social media. And when the brakes need to be replaced, you got the eight thousand dollars to go replace them brakes. Yeah. But you can afford two hundred dollars to get your brakes fixed on the Toyota Camry. Yeah. Like my Benz is sitting at the house right now, and I refuse to pay $800 or eight thousand bucks to get brakes fixed. And I can do it, but I'm like, that's again, like yeah. you got to be reasonable. Like you can't, like you're not the athlete. You can't expect to live the same life that I'm living. Yeah. Like now, man, yeah. Can I go buy my if I if I sign a deal for sixty million? Can I go buy my dad a new car? Or, yeah, but let me do that if that's what I want to do yeah. for you, dad or mom or it's gonna be no sister. Society or pressure nah, to do it. nah, nah, but I say that now, now if my kids make it, <laughs> where's my Bentley? <laughs> I hope my wife would never let me do that. But yeah. it's, it's amazing how married parents, like, I want to say take advantage of kids. I think the last case was, uh, you heard of what happened to Baker Merrifield. Mm -mm. So supposedly, uh, he invested some money into his parents' business or something, mm -hmm. something with an investment. And it came about that parents actually stole the money from him and lost it, or whatever. And it, yeah, and then and then tell him about it or something like. And he's actually suing him now or something. Or something. It's like real messy shit, right? Like, damn, like, man, yeah, money, money. They say, I mean, you know that old phrase, "Money is the root of all evil." I don't think it's the root of all evil, but it can bring a lot of evil in. Yeah, it doesn't need to be there. I mean, because because everybody wants to eat, everybody wants to be a part of something, right? And it's, I think it's awesome want to be a part of the limelight and to live that life and you know now you you shouldn't have no worries but to your point it shouldn't be an expectation you know like man yeah we go out to dinner i got it yeah. man don't pull your off i'm paying for dinner yeah. but just because i'm driving a bentley don't mean you need to be driving a bentley yeah. you know what i mean yeah. like if i want to let if i want to buy you a bentley that's cool but you shouldn't expect well man i know my boy's about to put me on yeah it's 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 Bro, the business of sports and entertainment in general is just because there's so much money to be made out there. Everybody feels entitled. So next, talk some about your your basketball playing days at Eastern Oregon. <laughs> like, what, what do you accomplish? How, was it fun for you? Like, talk about that a little bit. Um, yeah. Experience. I mean, I was I thought I was pretty good in high school. I was good in high school. Um, Bush was a small school. We played in smaller teams, but. A bunch of my friends that I grew up with, you know, they played at the Garfields, the Franklins. I went to Franklin for one year, my sophomore year. I played at Franklin. Um, 
but for me, basketball was just a, it was a means for me to get to the next level. I never had like this, like, I want to, I want to play in the NBA. I want to play overseas. That was never my, and again, playing at Eastern Oregon, I had some opportunities to play low level overseas. Um, so I was good enough, but I wasn't passionate about basketball like that. Like for me, basketball got me a scholarship. Um, it got me into school. Um, I liked it, but I wasn't in love with it. Like I, like I can remember <laughs> being in, you know, after practice, we're supposed to be in the weight room, lifting weights, man. As soon as my head coach left out the weight room, man, I turn around, I'm out of here. I just wasn't committed to it like that. Like I, I played off of my raw talent. Um, but again, like, you know, when I mentioned earlier, I wish my dad would have nudged me a little bit more to go to HBCU. I wish my, my college coach would have been on me a little bit more. Cause I, I think I could have been much better. You know, like I, I was in, I was in conversations about being like all conference. And, you know, I, I think my junior, my senior and junior year, I was like leading, you know, like in the top five leading the nation in assists and all types of stuff. But had I been pushed and, and been willing to be pushed, you know, the, the willingness to be pushed, I could have been so much better. But, but again, I enjoyed my time. But I think I also shared with you, I wasn't just, I wasn't there to just be an athlete. I was there to be a student first and my dad and my grandparents, you know, instilled that in me. But I, I love my time as an athlete. I think, I think I'm better now as a basketball player than I was when I was in college. I still play recreationally. I play about three, four times a week. I'm not as fast and as quick. But I think I'm a smarter player. But you're still an athlete, right? Yeah, I'm still an athlete. You know, it's like once you have it, you have it. But like I, I can shoot. I can shoot better now than I could in college because I was I was a true point guard. Like again, in the '90s, I didn't have combo guards. You weren't you weren't a combo guard. You were you had a point guard. You had a shooting guard. You were you were one or two. Yeah, and a center. Yeah. Now you got combo guards. You got you know. LeBron can play all five positions. You didn't have guys that could play all five positions back when I was playing. So I was a true point guard. My job was to facilitate, be the quarterback on the basketball court. And that's that's what I did. Where is East Oregon at? East Where Oregon is in the town called LaGrande, Oregon. Okay. So it's about from here, about a five hour, five and a half hour drive. I think I used to come home after after the season, I would drive home. I think I made it in four hours a couple of times. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's, 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 uh, I think Eastern Oregon is literally like two and a half hours from Boise, Idaho. Like okay. it's East. Okay. It's like really, east. like really East. Like going to, it's like going to Pullman. Okay. So like from Seattle to Pullman, I'd say like Portland to LaGrande. Okay. It's like that. It's far East, like almost to Idaho. So next you have a new role where you work at a company called, I think it's Mind Right Entertainment. Yep. Can you talk about that. So Mind Right Entertainment is a company that was created by my buddy, uh, one of my childhood best friends, John Kesey. John is, uh, John and I met at Bush in seventh grade. Um, John was one of the first families that embraced me and took me in. I think I shared with you, first time I went to John's house over in uh, Hunts Point, I was like flabbergasted, like, oh my gosh, John, you're rich. You know, John skied, his family went, you know, they they, they owned a family home over in Winthrop. It was a cabin thing was bigger than my house in, in the CD. Uh, um, my mom was amazing. I loved his mom. His dad was cool. He had an older brother. Like, but anyways, John, John um, left Bush after middle school and left and went to Lakeside, which a lot of guys did that back in the day. They would stay at Bush through middle school and then leave and go to Lakeside. So we lost touch for a little while um in college and things like that john's a lawyer by trade um but spent a lot of time in hollywood he's a hollywood writer and he's written for some some big name big name people that we know will smith denzel he's got a good relationship with f gary gray um, f gary gray is probably best known for straight out of compton um good friends with brian dobbins who's a producer of blackish um so john um wanted to bring me on from a sports because sports and entertainment kind of go hand in hand. Um, and, and with my access in sports and some of the people that I'm connected to and some of the projects that he's working on, uh, it just made sense for me to come on. So I'm a head of sports and head of sports content and kind of DEI stuff there just to give, give our people access. John's white and he, he will tell you he's very privileged and he has access and he can get indoors that unfortunately that I can't get in. So Together we partner up and we're um, 
building out the sports sports and entertainment side of mine right right now we've got some projects working on a project with marshawn lynch right now we're getting ready to um hopefully yeah, marshawn lynch it's my guy um getting ready to work on a project um hopefully i've got a uh talk about the certain mix a lot um talk about like the the history of hip-hop in seattle and how it was overshadowed by the grunge era because it really was i mean Seattle's got a rich history of hip hop here. Um, so we're going to be working on that project. And then just, again, sports content is hot right now. Everybody wants sports content. And there's a lot of amazing sports stories out here, just in the Northwest. Um, and a lot of these people that I'm connected to. So I'm looking forward to building that, that division up. For sure. I right. think Juan Fallon is the one person everyone in America would love to hang out with just for a couple of hours. Yeah. He's unfiltered. Yeah. Marshawn is always, I mean, I don't care if he's on 60 Minutes. Did you see that show he was on, on TMZ? Uh, you see that show he was on called Stars on Mars? I haven't seen it. It's, it's, but I heard it. I heard he was a real on there. there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's unfiltered. Like one one day, him and uh, Brown Arrows are wrestling. It's yeah. so freaking funny. Brown, of course, Brown Arrows like beat his ass. Yeah. Like, this is good at it. He's just, 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 like, just a fun guy, right? He, like I said, Marshawn is unfiltered, but that's what that's what everybody loves about him. He, he, He's one of the few people that, you know, he's not going to change to fit some stereotype or try to, I mean, I've seen him at his football camps, you know, and he's cussing it, talking to the kids. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, but again, he, he's, he is about as Bay area as a year. That's the, I mean, the joke in my family and around my friends is that Steve, you had to have lived in the Bay area at some point. Like I am so Bay area and I've never lived in the Bay area, but I just, I love all things Bay area. I'm a too short fan. I'm a, E40 fan. I'm a, I'm a uh, JT, the bigger figure, RBL, <laughs> like Frisco. Who's one man. for you? Spice One. Spice, come on, man. Spice <laughs> One. Ant Banks, man. I, I mean, I, I am a Mac Miller, Selly Cell, Be Legit, like the Click, Sugar T, like, yeah, I am Bay Area. <laughs> Everybody know my song is Blow the Whistle. It could be on in church. I would hop up in church and start dancing to some blood whistle. Wow. Man, that's funny. Yes, sir. So can you answer this? So they recently had a, a riot strike. How did that impact my riot? Um, I, I, mean, I can speak to that a little bit. It impacted my riot because they, they couldn't write. I mean, they couldn't write. And the actors went on strike. I mean, everything was halted. So that's when a lot of like unscripted stories came into place. Unscripted meaning like documentaries and um, like reality shows. And we started talking about a lot of that stuff, uh, just kind of how, how to put a lot of that stuff into play, which I think why sports content just kind of started to blow up during the strike. Um, but that really, that's really what it meant. Like John, as a writer, he couldn't write. Yeah, He couldn't write. I mean, people could call him and talk to him about stories and he would even have to be very careful and have to talk to his lawyers and his yeah. representation. And can I talk to these people about this? Can I not? Cause again, he could, could be breaking rules. Um, but basically it just, everything was shut down. He couldn't write at all. So. Okay. And the next, um, I saw we did a post for Jonathan is going to lead a AI Hollywood symposium hosted by mine. Right. Can you talk about that? That is going to be over in Dublin. Um, so they now have a Dublin office, and I have not met the Dublin people yet, but Mind Riot literally is blowing up. There's a project around Ocean Gate, which everybody, unfortunately, the story of the, the submersible kind of just imploding underwater. John um, was connected to Ocean Gate, the Ocean Gate people. And uh, so there's a story that's going to come out. Uh, about that he's got his hands on a, on a variety of different projects um with mine riot um what else aldous hodge is one of his really good friends they've got a movie coming out um again john can t and, and all these people are going to be in dublin or they're going to be on zoom and, and calling in to um talk during the symposium i know there's some other big names that he's working on right now norman lear is a name that you might know um, Jamie Lee Curtis is a name I heard that she will probably be participating. He wants me to go um, as head of sports content. I told him my bag is low right now, so I don't know if I can get the duck. <laughs> but um, I may zoom in for it, just talk about sports from a sports content and just kind of like my background and what I do um, and what we're looking to aim, looking what we're aiming to do at Mind Riot. So that's okay. going to be coming up here in November. And then recently you, you co-founded a company called, I think it's called 100X Sports Group. Ah, yeah. 
we won't talk about 100X. 100X is the company I think I, I mentioned a little earlier. It was a startup group that it, it's no longer, I'm no longer with 100X. I'll leave it okay. there. <laughs> it could have been something really, really special. And um, it, didn't pan out. It, it didn't pan out for me. Okay. I'll just leave it there. All right. So next, why become a sports agent, right? Like how's the process of deciding to be a sports agent for a career? Like how the whole thing work out, you know, like why that versus anything else you've done? Um, for me, I'm passionate about sports. Um, and I knew, I mean, I, I, I often tell people when I, when I do public speaking or speak to young folks or mentors, like I had a plan when I was in college. Like I said, I, I didn't have plans on being in the NBA. My, my being in the NBA was to either be in the front office or be a sports agent. That was my plan. And I had, and I had these steps down on how I was going to get there. Literally spoke with my college counselor. And she made me write these steps like, okay, so how are you going to get there? Like, what, what's the plan? And so for me, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll be honest, I saw the movie Jerry Maguire. I'm not going to front. A lot of people see that movie and like, yeah, that's what I want to do. I knew that's what I wanted to do. And I put my plan in action. Like I wanted to be, and that movie is based off of Lee Steinberg, um, who was big, one of the biggest in the football space at the time, sports agent. But I knew that I wanted to be a sports agent. I wanted to be around athletes. I felt like I had something to offer. And at the time, I wanted, I, I wanted to make sure that I was working for Black agents. So my plan was to, I needed to somehow get a job with the Seattle Sonics after I graduated. So the summer before I graduated, so the summer going into my senior year, I did an internship with the Sonics in the game operations division. And so then I go back to school, my senior season, and I come out and I get offered a job. Um, not that summer. So I went back, interned again that summer after graduation. And then I was actually going to take a job. I had accepted a job in the admissions department at Eastern Oregon University. And again, it was something to fall back on. And it was like, you know, I didn't have another job. And so literally right after my internship, I got offered a job with the Sonics. And so I declined that job. I forget the lady's name who was head of admissions, but she was really pissed at me. But oh, well, um, <laughs> I had to follow my heart, follow my dream. It's a little, I go to work for the Sonics. I'm in the game. I'm the game operations assistant. And that was my whole plan. If I was going to work, if I was going to become a sports agent, I need to be around players. Game operations is about as close as you get to the players without being on the court. Like we, game operations is the entertainment. So when you go to a game, whether it's hockey, baseball, basketball, whatever it is, where the music, where the national anthem, where the, the cheerleaders, the dancers, the mascot, where the entertainment, the, 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 the big boards, the screens, the commercials, the, for the entertainment and um, being in game operations, it actually gave me like full access to all the locker rooms. So visiting teams come, like I'm in the locker rooms, you know, you're, you're around the locker rooms, you know, obviously I got really close with GP. Um, and then I got close with Eric and well, not Aaron at the time, Aaron good or Eric Goodwin. Eric lived here, Aaron lived in the Bay area and they together were good with sports management. And at the time they were, um, one of the biggest sports agencies in the game. I mean, when I went and worked, when I started working for GP, like Eric and Aaron, I mean, they represented Chris Weber, Paul Pierce, Jason Kidd, obviously GP, Sharif Abdurrahim. These are names people will know, you'll know. Um, Damon Stoudemire. Um, and then, you know, once I really got into like my agent space and they gave me an opportunity, I mean, at one point they represented LeBron James, Dwight Howard, Nate Robinson, Jamal Crawford. Patty Mills, Kevin Durant, um, DeMar DeRozan, Honey <laughs> Stuckey, who was my first client um, in the NBA. Uh, and so I was around all this. Like, I was, like, literally, I tell people, like, my story, like, it's, it's not luck, but it's like this Cinderella-type story. Like, I couldn't have scripted that story any other way. Like, I... Right place, right time, but God had his hands all over it, if that makes sense. Um, so for me, being a sports agent, I think it's something that you have to seek out. You don't just fall into it. Um, and it is a lot of work. Recruiting players, um, recruiting players is hard. Like you have to study people. You got to know people. You got to know the right doors to get into, the right doors to crack. You got to have a ton of relationships across the AAU circuit, the college basketball circuit. You got to know coaches. You got to, you got to have people that can open up doors for you. Um, and there's a dark side to it. Like 
like anything. There's a lot of stuff that goes on underneath the table that, again, that's not how I get on, but it happens. Um, but my story is not, I don't think my story is very typical. Most people, I know a lot of people that want to come into the industry and they'll go work for like a big, huge agency. There's, there's a couple, like there's an Octagon, there's CAA, there's um, Wasserman. These are big agencies that they represent a ton of sports and they, they have media, they have television, they, they represent Olympic sports. They, but they'll bring in, they have positions for interns, right? Um, and so you might go there and you might work in the mail room, literally work in the mail room or be somebody's assistant, but you're not really like in the show. You're not really like out here in the field. Like those big agencies, you got to bring something to the table. Like you got to be connected to an up and coming athlete to really, really get an opportunity or somebody's just give you, got to give you a chance. And I had a, I had an opportunity and a chance with the good ones. They, they gave me an opportunity. They believed in me and I'm forever grateful. Those are my guys. I wound up leaving in 2009, which if I could do it all over again, I don't know that I would have left. Or if I would have left, I would have left differently, but I was young. I was young. I was maybe too ambitious, um, but those are my guys. I love them. I love them to death, and I wouldn't be where I am without, without that start with those guys. You know, if you're like a lawyer, you have to take a bar exam, you yep. have CPA. Yep. You have to do anything like that to become a sports agent? Yes, you do. Be okay. Yes, you How do. about that? Uh, so when I said be so when I, and that's only been implemented, I want to say within like the last 10 years, but you didn't always have to take a test. So when I was, when I first became an agent, you just had to fill out an application, you know, they do the background checks and all that stuff, send in your, at the time it was like $1,500. And they basically, after they do their background check, give you a yes or no, but now you actually have to physically take a test. You have to go to either New York or I want to say Santa Monica. They have they have like these agent uh, conferences every year, one in New York and one in Santa Monica. If my if my memory serves me correctly, so you have to take a test now. So if I if I so I'm not technically certified now. I still call myself a sports agent because I understand the business and I've been a sports agent. Um, but I'm not looking to. I don't want to necessarily be certified because I don't need to be certified. I want to. I have a couple guys that I work with that are certified and you know know the business just as well as I do. If not better, again, I don't always need to be the smartest in the room, but I'm really getting ready to focus my efforts and energies. I want to build a coaches division. Um, one of my best friends is a NCAA Division One coach, and he's 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 a year or two away from being a high level Division One coach. You know what I mean? So um, I really I'm really passionate about coaches. I think coaches are a gateway to these young men and young women, and in cultivating uh, building culture. I think that's important um, and doing it the right way with good people. Again, it's not, it, sh it should not just be about the bag and who's offering the most. I think you need to be in programs that fit your ability because a lot of kids, you know, they get recruited by these schools and then they go to a school and well, this ain't what the coach said it was going to be. Well, but you was chasing that $50,000. Or that coach takes another job. Needs, he gets prepared. Like there's so many different elements that come into it. So um, that's really, I'm, I'm, I'm looking to build. My, my next my next move is going to be my best move. And I think God has now put me in a position where I can flourish and the resources around me. I want to, I want to build something unique. I mean, right now you hear about my guy, Rich Paul, who's doing a phenomenal job with Clutch. Rich has built an empire and he's continuing to build. And at some point I got to believe that Rich is going to ride off into the sunset. And he, he deserves that. I, I think if I had a LeBron James, I would build and ride off into the sunset too. I mean, LeBron gave him an op awesome opportunity. Um, again, unique opportunity, but Rich has done it the right way. And he's, if, if, if you can take anything from what he's done, he's surrounded himself with good people. Right. And they have helped propel him, you know, cause he'll tell you, he hasn't done it all by himself, but he's learned a lot of the game just by being observant and listening. So, you know, me having been in this for 20 plus years, I'm now 48 years old. I've seen it all. I've done it all. Um, and I know exactly where I'm going now. How do you recommend either a set of parents to find the right agent for the kid or for a kid to find the right agent for them? Hmm. That's a tough question. Um, I think, well, one way you can start, you know, parents and kids can always call the NBA Players Association. That's, that's one way people can find out, right? I don't know if that's the atypical way of doing it nowadays. I think a lot of people, it's, Cause when, when a kid is hot, like let's say a kid is hot. I mean, I know people that start recruiting a kid when he's in sixth grade, 
you know, you might take a shot in the dark or you have friends that are coaches, right? That are connected to these kids that may have recruited this kid or I know the mom, I know the dad, let me connect you. I'm referral based nowadays. I don't, I don't recruit the same way. Like when I was 25, right? I don't, I'm not everywhere. I'm not in every gym. I don't, I don't even have the capacity to do that. Right. So what I really like to do is build off of relationships and have, you know, referrals, like have a coach say, Hey, let me call this mom or dad for you um, to put you in touch. And the one thing I don't do, I don't, I don't ever deal with kids directly. I think it's, um, I think it's disrespectful to the mom or dad, the parents or the guardian, whoever, unless that kid is on his own, which typically is not. It might, he might have a coach that's kind of handling stuff. I think that's how you build on the relationships, doing, doing stuff the right way. Now, if somebody's just against you, well, at that point, you got to figure out and do what you got to do if you really want that kid. But I try to do things on the up and up. Okay. And it's like, you hear a lot of times players, like they're in the NBA or NFL or whatever, the contract's coming up. Mm-hmm. You see it's like something like those like hands-on, right? They'll, mm-hmm. they'll have the agent with like, they talk about what they want. Other players are like, you know what? Don't ask me a question. My agent handles everything. My agent says, sign a contract with somewhere else. I'm guessing what we're doing, right? Mm-hmm. What should a player do? Say like 100% trust an agent or they just like really like <laughs> be hands-on and involved? Again, I think, I think players should always be hands-on. I don't think you should ever be in a situation not that you're signing some type of power of attorney document so your agent handles everything, but I've heard, I've heard those situations before. But I think, I think we're in a day and age where there's so much money to be made. There's so many different opportunities um, that you got to do your checks and balances. Like you, I'm not saying you have to know down to the penny how much money you have or how much you could potentially have, but understand the business. Understand that you're the business. Um, you're the entity, right? Like the agents, like in, in, I think it's no secret that we hear this quite often, but at least I say it, you know, the agent works for you. You don't work for the agent. And sometimes it can get twisted a little bit where the agents become like the, they're the star, right? And again, maybe that works for in certain relationships and maybe some, some guys don't want to be hands-on. Well, that's, that's when you get robbed. That's when, that's when money comes up missing. That's when, you know, again, if you, you got to be able to do basic stuff, you got to understand your contract. Even if it, if, if it, even if the contract is um, rigorous, like you can break it down in layman terms. Nothing, no, no, no sports player, athlete contract is that strenuous that they can't understand the basic terms of their contract. I think again, the 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 agent's job is to be an advisor, right? The agent's job is not, again, in my viewpoint, is not to make the sole decision for them. The agent's job is to lay out the options, advise. Here's A, B, and C. If you're asking my opinion, this is what I think. I'm presenting this to you. Now, Jason, what do you think? What makes the most sense to you? Yeah. And then we discuss, we talk about it, and then we and, and then the player makes an informed decision. Now I can help and advise you on that decision. Like I said, my job is to present you with all the, the pertinent information to help you make a sound decision. But I don't, I don't think the agent's job should be making the decision. Has this ever happened? Like, or like, or like a player was going to sign a bad deal. You recommend don't, don't sign it. And you're like, okay, like if you sign this bad deal, it's going to look bad on me because people don't think I recommend this deal to you. Of course that happens. Or the opposite where a guy wanted to sign a contract and he left money on the table and the agent said, don't sign that contract. I'm going to get you something better and something better never came along. That happens too. And that's when guys wind up finding their agents. Agents wind up, you know, sometimes it can be the vice versa. Agent might find the client, right? And, and that didn't work out and they part ways and then they go to arbitration and, <laughs> and it's like, whose fault is it? Right. And, I mean, I think that's when it gets messy. You try to steer clear of all that. That's why I think, you know, you got to have these discussions ahead of all this stuff. Like, let's, let's talk it out. Like, here's what's going to be on the table. Like, there's going to be a five-year deal. There's going to be a three-year deal. And then there's going to be a deal where you could potentially get trade. Let's talk about what makes sense. Is there like a standard uh, industry norm for like agency fees or like do people like Lee Steinberg get to pay, uh, charge more money because like Lee like Steinberg is like some kind of standard that everyone applies across the board? I think football is, I think the max you can charge on an NFL contract is 3%. Don't quote me on that. 
but I think it's 3%. I know in the NBA it's 4%. Um, nowadays, guys try to negotiate with their agents sometimes. Well, I don't want to pay you 4%. I'll give you 2.5%. Oh, I got to pay my coach 1%. And then I got to, you know, I told my mom and dad, I give them 1%. I'll give you 2%. You know what I mean? So I think there's, there's those type of negotiations that happen. Again, I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong. Um, your question was, is there a max or is it, yeah, the max uh, an, an agent can charge a client is 4%. Just by law or something, just a, just a standard? It's, right. it's, it's, in, it's within the NBA Players Association. Like the collective like, agreement. Yeah, the collective bargaining agreement. Yep. Yep. Um, and my, my take on that is well, when you start opening that, that, that conversation up and it, and it gets out there, I think everybody's looking for a, a a way to save more money. And I don't know necessarily that you're saving more money. Like you want me to go out and negotiate my ass off for you and get you the best deal, but you don't want to pay me for my efforts. You only want to give me half of my efforts, right? And 2%. So for me, I don't know that I would ever start. And yeah, I'll negotiate 2%. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you 2%. Now some circumstances, it may, it may be okay. I don't know. I think that's up to the agent and the client, but, um, but to answer your question, the max the max is four okay. percent in the NBA. I know Lamar Jackson recently like did his own contract. I know mm -hmm. some people said, "Well, what he held out like franchise tag." I know people said, "Well, you had an agent, that doesn't happen, right?" Mm -hmm. But then people said, "Well, you actually save money." But like you said, he really save money. Like mm -hmm. time's money, right? You run on the headache, so I don't know. I think. Well, I think guys are getting you know because Lamar Jackson. I think he relied on his family to help him with his negotiations and his deal, and he was convicted in how he wanted to move around his deal. And again, I, I applaud guys in that, those particular situations, because I think he got exactly what he wanted and he negotiated. These athletes are smarter. Bobby Wagner negotiated, I believe his last deal with the Seahawks and maybe even with the Rams. Like some of these guys, they don't, you can go out and get an agent and have an, or excuse me, a lawyer look over your contract. You know, you can charge him, you know, he's charged you $500 for his, you know, an hour for his fees to make sure his contract is, solid or in good standing but that's what the that's the a lot of people don't understand that's what these player associations are for like the nba players association the nfl players association they have lawyers those those associations are there to protect the players so they act so if you're in the nba you can go out and negotiate your own deal excuse me and then take it to the nba players association hey can you guys look this over for me i want to make sure that i'm getting the best deal Do you see any flaws in this deal that's what the players association is there for. Um, and I'm not saying that you solely use them, um, but they are there to protect the players and to work with the agents. Have you had to deal with this in the past for like, you know, like, of course you're going to take your, your, your players and stuff, but how, what happens if someone's like, when you're playing like, we'll say quote unquote, like too needy, right? They ask you if you do too much stuff. <laughs> like, how does that work? I think, I think you have to set the boundaries. If you're willing to do some of that stuff. I know guys that live with their clients. Um, especially when they're younger, right? Like when they're rookies or in their second year, they live with their clients. Um, I think, but, but uh, again, that's a loaded question. I think as an agent, I don't think an agent technically is there based upon the NBA players association, you're to negotiate the NBA contract. But I think a role of an agent is much more like for me, my role as an agent or a manager, I've always viewed it as much more than just signing your contract. I think I'm supposed to help you navigate life to some degree. I think I'm supposed to be a mentor. Um, Cause again, you gotta remember some of these dudes that man, they've never even washed their own clothes. They don't even know how to write a check or they've never been to a bank. Um, sometimes you're gonna be a babysitter. You gonna have to call. I mean, you're supposed to be at this interview about like two o'clock. You're supposed to be there at one thirty. What's up? You gotta hold them accountable. Sometimes you're gonna be a uh, a therapist. I mean, it's, it's, it's a job that it ain't for everybody, you know? And, and like, I, I think I said this when I first got on, people see the glitz and the glam, the kick. Oh man, you, I saw you at the game sitting courtside and man, man, you was with GP and blah, 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 blah. I saw you on TV. Yeah, cool. But they don't see all the stuff when the dude's angry and he see, man, his client or one of his, one of his teammates is getting something that well, why didn't I get that? Well, you're supposed to, then you got to talk them off a ledge and when they want to fire you and they don't want to fire you and they think about, 
I, it is a cycle. And I joked around earlier, like, you know, that being the VIP at the, at the fancy club at 2 in the morning, yeah. you might be there to make sure that Joker leaves at 2.30 in the morning and be, be at practice at 7 in the morning. Make sure you ain't going home with a bunch of chicks or making sure you ain't making sure these goons over here in the corner ain't following you to, to rob you. I mean, you just, there's so many things you have to take in consideration. And because, again, you're a target. You can be a target, you know, and, and some guys, like I said, some guys like the limelight and that's what they want to do. So you have to, you have to figure out how to safeguard them and protect them, but you also have to make them aware. Like you gotta, you're, you're the business. You're an entity now. You got to treat it like it's a business because the moment you don't, they'll get rid of you. Yeah. There's always somebody else coming up behind you. Definitely. So as your time with agent, have you had like, who's been like your dream client? My dream client. <laughs> I haven't had a dream client yet. I haven't had a dream client. That's why that's just part of like I've had I've worked with some good guys. And again, I haven't had a ton of my own clients. I've worked with a lot of guys. Um, because I've never like this space where I'm at now, um, it's a space of like it's my time. You know, I've done a lot of research on like some of the wealthiest people in the world, right? Like when I think about like the Warren Buffets and the the Jeff Bezos and 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 a, a buttload of other millionaires and multimillionaires and billionaires. Like you see these people shining and eating. Like if you do some research, some of the stuff that I've read and seen on YouTube, most of these guys don't even they, they haven't really made it until like their mid and late 40s, into their 50s. And you see them, you know, especially some of the older guys that are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, you just assume that and they've been born since they was 20. So I say all that to say, like, you know, one of my mentors was like, bro, you're, Steve, your time is coming. Like, it's, it's getting, like, as cliche as it sounds, Jason, and I think it sounds so corny. I hate that I'm about to say it, but my stars are aligning. Like, I don't, I don't have a stress in the world, you know, and I don't have everything that I want. I don't have it, but I have everything that I need. You know what I mean? Like, I've got to. People get that mixed up. Yeah. Yeah, man. Like, I. I've had, I've had ev everything that I've ever needed, I've had. And I would even say everything that I've ever wanted, I've had. I've had all the cars. I've, I mean, I had my first Benz I had when I was like 22. I've had several Benzes. I've been on the private jets. I've been, I've been to Jamaica. I've been to Italy. I've been to Cabo. I've been, there's nothing in this life that I haven't done. And I'm not rich. Um, I think God has just protected me and always surrounded me with good people. But like, as far as like the stuff that I manifest and have put out there in the universe, like I, my best friends, shout out to the lifers. Uh, my best friends know, like God put it on my heart probably 13 years ago that he was going to send me $600 million. Now my, my boys, my best friends, you, if you ask them, they will tell you, yeah, you can't tell banks. The 600 million is not coming. Like, it's so embedded in me, they know it's coming. And that, man, I didn't want to come. Don't forget about us. You know what I mean? It's like that. But I mean, I'm really like, my, my, my time is coming. Like, all the stars are literally aligning. Like, the business that's coming my way, the, the doors that are starting to open right now. Like, literally, just yesterday, um, I got a call from a big sports agency out of New York. And yeah, I'll just, I'll leave it there. But the founder of that sports agency is, if I said his name, which I don't, I don't, because again, I don't believe in putting stuff out there. I'm, I'm very superstitious like that. But if I told you, it's like some of the stuff that happens to me, a lot of people would be like, man, get out of here, bank. You're like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you're like, you're like, you're like, to show you a text message, you're like, oh shit. Like, so I don't, like, my, my time is coming. You know what I mean? Like, everybody has a season. In my season, you know, there were times where I would like, man, God, like, why do you have me here? Why am I supposed to be doing this? But he's just, he's been prepping me. Everything that he's had me go through, he's been prepping me for what's coming down the pipe right now. So do you ever plan on retiring? Are you going to work until then? I think I will be, hold on, I'm 48 right now. I'll be retired by 60. 60, okay. Yeah, that's my goal. But do you think you'll be able to retire? Do you think you'll mentally be able to retire or you, or you have, always have to be doing something? No, um, cause what's, so here's the thing. <laughs> I, I will be doing something till at least I'm 60 because my boys won't be out of the house. I'll be, when they're 20, I'll be 60. 
So at least until 60, I'll be moving around and this and that. But like my ultimate goal is to start the Banks Family Foundation. I want to start a Banks Family Foundation. I want to give back to my community. I want to, I just want to help people. I, lo- I love to pour into people. I just, I just happen to like to do it as a sports manager, and sports agent now, right? Like that's because that's my passion. But um, so when the 600 million comes, I'll let you know, but it's, it's on the way, man. Like I, you couldn't tell me it's not coming. Yeah. Are you talk about mentors. Can you talk about some of your mentors? Yeah. Man, I could rattle off a couple of names right now. Bruce Hosford. I've known Bruce Hosford since. Bruce, Bruce is a white man. Um, I've known Bruce since I was a freshman in high school. Um, Bruce is one of my mentors. Kenny Nolan. Kenny, Kenny's known me since I was a freshman in high school. Um, Kenny's like a father. Bruce is like a father. Brother named Rasul Pasha, black man here in Seattle, like a father figure mentor. Like I would say my grandfather, Fred Banks, who's not with us anymore, but he was probably my greatest mentor. Um, um, my dad, uh, you know, I, yeah, my dad, one of my, one of my guys, RJ Barsh, who's actually younger than me, but RJ, he's smart. He's knowledgeable. He's, he's got an old soul. It's funny because I, I, I think you can have mentors that are younger than you. Oh yeah. I think you can have people around you that, that pour into you that are younger than you. I don't, I don't have, just because I'm older doesn't mean I'm, I have all the knowledge. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think a lot of people miss opportunity to get mentored by younger people. Right? Yeah, man, for sure. Um, yeah, man, I've, I've got my pastor, Pastor Manuel, Tabernacle Missionary Baptist Church here in Seattle, like Pastor Manuel. We don't talk all the time. I haven't talked to Pastor Manuel in forever. But I know that if I talked to him today, he would drop a nugget on me. Um, and he's spiritual, right? Uh, my big brother, Mike Moss. Um, Mike and I have known each other for... 13, 14 years now. Um, Mike's like my spiritual brother, older. He's an elder. Um, he's a pastor in the church, but he's another mentor. And again, all these guys play different roles as mentors. Some are spiritual. Some are, it's, it's business. Some are accountability partners. You know, when I'm going through my stuff, kick my ass in shape, kick my ass in the gear. Um, and then, you know, I, I've never considered it like my, my, my brother's mentors, but my brother D'Amico and my brother EC, um, they're like my mentors. Um, and EC is one of like, you know, again, they're not my biological brothers, but there's blood couldn't make us any closer. Right. All I, I've known them all of my life. Um, my best friend, Tim, who just retired from the air force, Tim is like a mentor. He's somebody that I look, I, I look, look up to again, Tim's younger than me, like a year younger than EC and I, we all grew up together, but just, I've been blessed to have just smart, intelligent people around me. You know, I do a lot of, you know, I ask questions, but not as often as I just observe. I'm, I'm, that's how I learn just by observing, being around people. My guy, Chris Lucci, Chris uh, is a sports agent out of Atlanta. I think I mentioned him earlier. He's a mentor. It's my guy, you know, I love him to death, even though, you know, he might not be happy with what he hears, what I got going on with another agency. <laughs> That's my guy. We're always going to ride to the wheels fall off. Um, so, yeah, man, I'm, I'm blessed to have some good people around me. GP, GP is a mentor, big brother. Um, you know, it's, it's, I probably take that for granted more than I know other people like, oh, my God, you know, Gary Payton. Yeah, he's GP to them. Like, he's just Gary to me, you know what I mean? But, yeah, he's another one. I could call Gary for anything. So second part to me, the more important part of the question, who are you, who are you mentoring right now? <sighs> who am I mentoring right now? That's a good question. I don't, it's funny. I think I mentor people, but I don't see it as mentoring because they haven't physically asked me to, hey, will you be my mentor? And there's oftentimes I get that. So I can't say that I'm mentoring anybody, but I guess I, I give a lot of different people gang knowledge um i'm sure that'll change after this panel that i'm speaking on at the bush school here in a couple weeks on mentorship um and that's one of my main reasons for sitting on the board is to be a mentor um to students of color kids that look like me so they have a place and they have a voice i can advocate for them that's one of the reasons why i sit on the board um damn that's a good question i never thought about that who am i mentor? <laughs> Um, I'm sure you're mentoring people. Actually, just not yeah, think about yeah, it. I can't even think of, think of any names right now. But I talk to a lot of people. Yeah, I talk to a lot of young folks that want to, you know, want to be a sports agent, want to be in the game, and you know, I try to give 
give as much game as I can. Sure. So now next, can you talk about your own company? Like how it got started, what you focus on now, what your future for is in the future? Um, my company, Bank Sports Ventures, I started in 2010. And again, I alluded to when I stepped away from Goodwin Sports, I, um, because the Goodwin, they, they were very successful, right? And I didn't see a place for me to grow there. Um, and again, if I can go back and do it all over, I, I, I would. I would probably say, hey, I'm going to start my own company. I want to be under the Goodwin Sports umbrella. Um, and I want to build. What do you guys think about that? Now, I don't know what their answer would have been. I, but I bet they would have, yeah, let's build together. We'll split fees. We'll do whatever. But let us help you out, right? But my, my ambition got in the way. And um, nonetheless, I started my own company, Bank Sports Ventures, in 2010. And again, I'm, Bank Sports Ventures is a little fish in a big pond, right? And so I've had some good times. I've had some bad times. I've partnered up with other companies along the way. Um, but I think I'm now in a spot where um, I have resources and access to some stuff to either build and grow this thing or partner up with an, another agency that wants my services and that I can, again, do the same thing, build and develop. So I'm in the building. I want to build. I want to, I have some solid people around me now that some younger, some younger generation, like that next generation, a couple of lawyers that are agents, they're NFL certified, they're NBA certified, and they're, so I guess, yeah, now it's starting to come to me, right? Some people that like look to me like, thanks, man. We will follow your lead, right? Um, so there's like three guys that I can deal with. There's an, uh, an older agent that I've gotten really close with over the last couple of years named Tony Dutt. Um, Tony's a senior agent. He's negotiated over 10 or, you know, over a billion dollars in contract negotiations. Um, we've been talking about potentially partner up and doing some stuff. I've, you know, my heart oftentimes tells me, man, I need to go back home. And I'm meaning, like, do I go back to Goodwin Sports and where it all started? You know, because I know Eric and Aaron, they're getting older and I don't know how much longer they're, they're going to be in the business, but helping build that brand up and, you know, having it come full circle. Um, Cause I'm reignited, honestly. Um, so I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know where. I mean, I know where I want to go. I really want to build a coaches division. I really want to build up a sports management group and I want to build up something special here in the Northwest that's ultimately becomes global. Um, and, and is a force to be reckoned with. And I, I have the capacity to do it. I think I have the resources to do it. Um, and I'm now, you know, I've gotten connected to, there's a lot of money here in Seattle. Not that you didn't know that, but <laughs> I mean, there's, I mean, we, we hear the big names, right? Whether it's Howard Schultz or Bezos or Bill Gates, but you got to remember those guys, Ballmer, but those guys have friends that they've done business with and that they they've grown their businesses with, right? And so I'm I'm plugged in in that circle to some degree, right? Through some of my some of my mentors. I forgot to mention a guy named Tad Harmon, who's one of my mentors. Um, Tad is my guy. He's one of my biggest cheerleaders, right? Um, so I'm, I, shit's about to pop off. That's, that's, all, <laughs> that's all I can say, man. Like, yeah. you know, I, I've been doing it, but I've been doing it on purpose. And as far as money, like people don't realize the big manufacturing base we have here. Yeah. People know, talk about try to seafoods, a billion dollar seafood coming out of Ballard, yep. right? Yep. There's like so much money here, like. Costco. Oh, yeah, Costco, yeah. Costco started here. I mean, like, again. One of my mentors, Dana Frank. See, I, see, I can go on and on. Dana's, Dana's uncle is Quincy Jones. Like, Dana is, and Dana's a mover and a shaker. Like, if you don't know Dana, you don't, you don't know anybody. Like, Shane Coakley. Like, people who have, like, thanks, I got you. Eric Metcalf, NFL great. Like, E. Metcalf lives here in Seattle. Like, these are people that are, like, I could call and, like, I got you. What you need? Who you need me to connect you with? Like, and everybody doesn't have that. But I think, again, that, that happens over time, but you have to, especially with people that are older than you, you gotta, you gotta reach out, you know, and uh, this new generation, they all, all they like to do is text. <laughs> Here's a good question for you. Well, first, we ask a question. I didn't realize this until like right after Bill Russell died. I didn't realize he actually lived here in Seattle. Mercer I, Island. I had no clue, right? I thought he lived in Boston, but he lived in Mercer Island. Well, the Jefferson. That was like his own course, yeah. Jefferson. Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I know his wife, Jeannie, really well. So, a question for you is like, no, there's always talking, you know, like, you know, giving people opportunities, whatever, right? So is it the responsibility, like, we'll say, we'll say, like, like, rich people and poor people, you know? Mm -hmm. So perhaps the rich people reach down to central district or, like, an economic disadvantage neighborhood, hey, come here to these networking, because the networking stuff all the time is here, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. 
is it, hey, come do this stuff, or is, or the people like, you know, economic disadvantage, do they find the opportunity, right? That's tough. That one's tough for me to answer because I don't sit and wait for nobody. I go out and find it. It's I, like so many people like, oh, I'm downtrodden, I'm this, I'm that, but yet they never leave the block, the neighborhood. Like, yeah, no. In Seattle, there's literally a network thing every, every day. Yeah, there's always something. It's, it's, you, you could Google like Eventbrite meetup, you know, meetup AI or yep. tech or yep. marketing yep. or whatever interest. There's something going on somewhere. Yeah. And with public transportation, I mean, you might have to walk a full block. So, yeah. But yeah. I think, I think, I think once you just, once you find what like makes you tick, then you just go. Like there's something like for me, once I knew it was sports, I just, I, it was go time. Like as a youngster, like, Graduating from college and being around that like basketball atmosphere, I knew I need I need to connect with Eric Goodwin. I need to connect with GP. I need to, and once I got in those circles, then it was making sure I'm connected to other people because it just it just continues to grow. You know what I mean? And I I think you have to have some fight in you. You have to have some dog in you. Everybody's not just giving you shit. And I think a lot of this, you know, and again, I I don't I'm not just gonna pick on this younger generation, but Sometimes people just want to sit back with a cool jacket on and wait for stuff to happen. Man, if you just sit around waiting for stuff to happen, you're going to get left in the dust. Like, you have to have some initiative. You have to have some go-getter in you. Um, and, Seattle's, and Seattle's a different city. Seattle's not one of those cities you can just sit back. Like, Seattle is it's kind of the who's who. You got to be in certain crowds. You got to know how to move. You got to, sometimes you got to drop names to get in certain doors. And i respectively, I have done that. And it's funny when I hear people say, man, I dropped your name. <laughs> and they let you in. Like, <laughs> Whose name did you drop? Like, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it's, it's part of growing up at the end of the day. And if, and if you can't advocate for yourself, you can't expect nobody else to advocate for you. Yeah. Talk about this. Like, I think when I was young, like in teenager, 20 years old, I was like, man, when I get to my 40, 50, I'm, I'm going to be older than crap. But now, I have like so much focus, much energy, yeah. much stuff I want to do. Can you talk about like all the focus you have right now? All the stuff you want to accomplish? <laughs> Here's the thing. It's like all this stuff. It's like all this stuff. So I bought my first home in 2006. And I bought my home on the east side. I'm in Kirkland because I figured, because again, if you remember, I told you, like my, my friend John, he lived on the east side. So, and growing up in Seattle, all the rich people lived on the east side. So, it was always embedded in me. When I bought my first home, I'm buying my first home in the east side. And I bought my first home in Kirkland. Um, and what was your question again? I lost my train of thought. I like how you have someone. Oh, I have so much energy. Focus. Yeah, focus. And, focus. and so, it's now I'm 48, and I feel like I've done a lot of stuff, but I'm always that guy that, like, done a lot of stuff for other people, right? Like, now it's time to do for me. Right. And so that's what I'm focused on. And things that I was doing back in like 2006 and 2007, like I made an investment of $20,000 back in 2007, if not 2023, that investment is now about to pop. Right. And so the fruits of my labor and, you know, again, just thinking about how things take time to manifest, things take time to come to fruition, things take time to bubble up. And I was talking to my barber because we, you know, we, we both talk about like, you know, the law of attraction and just sometimes you got to let stuff simmer. Like Microsoft didn't happen overnight. Amazon didn't happen overnight. Like those guys put in blood, sweat and tears and my blood, sweat and tears was the money and being patient. And because there was times with this particular investment, I was ready to pull out and like, no, I want my money back. And had I done that, oh man, I'd be sick. You know what I mean? I'd be sick. But now it's like where I'm at now, I'm like, this, this particular investment's about to set me up. It's going to be part of that 600 million that I talk about. Right. Like, um, and so that way, I mean, again, and having mentors position me and, and again, how I got in that investment was one of my mentors and hey, you need to do this. I didn't really know what it was. I didn't, I understood the concept. And he was like, it's not, this isn't a get rich quick scheme. It's going to take some time, but you need to be a part of this. So I went to the bank back when I felt like I was balling, took out $20,000 and boom, done. So that was 2007, not 2023. So 
a lot of my energy comes from, I know where I'm going now. Like I used to just follow people. And even though I was a go-getter, like I, I wasn't solely focused on like doing my thing. And I, I just feel like the pandemic, um, especially during the pandemic, like if you, if you wasn't going out and getting it, like you, you ain't hungry, you're not hungry. And I think the pandemic just awakened something in me. And I'm not a serial entrepreneur. I, I'm not, I'm not a corporate guy. I can't, I can't be corporate, especially when I, I know and feel like I'm smarter than some of the people that would be leading me or my boss. And I'm like, eh. yeah, that was my problem. Post army, like, dude, I can't work. Yeah. I can't work for you. And, and, and I, I would rather double down and better myself. Um, and nobody knows me better than me. And I, you know, I'll be very frank. Like I, I'm a dreamer. Like that's why my wife is corporate. Somebody's got to make sure we have a check on the first 15th. Right? Like I'm a dreamer and she knows that about me. Right. And so she, you know, she's like, okay, do you think I trust you? But everything that I've planted those seeds on, whether it was 10 years ago or 13 years ago or 20, damn near 20 years ago, all that shit's about to, it's, it's manifesting and coming to fruition now. Let's suppose someone out there listening to this, like, man, I want like either intern for Steve or work for Steve. How will they like get on your radar? How will they convince you to give them a chance? Man, reach out to me on LinkedIn. They just go to LinkedIn. LinkedIn is like the business networking spot. I recently just <laughs> created a Facebook page about two months ago, which I avoided Facebook for so long. Well, I'm glad I, I got on it because I've been able to reconnect with like a lot of college friends that I hadn't spoken to for a while, but um yeah i would say linkedin reach out to me on linkedin and i'm i'm always down to have coffee i'm a i'm a face-to-face -face person i don't i'm not a big fan of zoom and all that type of stuff like let's you know obviously we had to do that type of stuff during the pandemic but i still feel like people lean on that a little too much like let's let's get face to face and again because that way i can read you and you can read me like we i might not be a good mentor for you i might not be anybody you want to mess with um typically i don't do um internships but that could shift depending on what happens here within like i would say the next month so steve can you share your uh, social media links with us so people can reach out to you oh gosh mm, i can't believe you're asking me that i think on instagram my ig handle is sbanks underscore bsb that's my instagram um linkedin just look up steve banks yeah steve banks on that might be steve banks jr I have a, what do they, they don't even call it Twitter anymore. Isn't it called X or something yeah. like that? I'm on there, but I think that's the same thing. I think that's S banks underscore BSB or something like that. But yeah, just look up Steve Banks. Um, I feel like, I feel like we're going around the room. Like I mean, listen to the plastic cup boys. I can't remember. Like, 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 I'm usually just posting my kids on my Instagram, but LinkedIn's probably the best place. Okay. I respond to, I respond for the most part to LinkedIn. Um, I'm on LinkedIn because I, I get hits on there as well, but yeah, I'm just trying, I'm trying to be a businessman uh, or as Jay-Z says, a businessman. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like I just want to grow I'm, you know, as a black man, I think it's, it's our time. It's, it's time to, it's cool to be black right now. Right. And it's time to capitalize and, 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 and get after it and, and, and getting after it means it's on me. Steve, is, is anything else that I asked you that I didn't or anything else you want to talk about? Um, nah, what time is it? I got to go pick up my damn kid. Yeah, it's like 2.59. Nah, we good. Um, no, I don't, I don't think so. I feel like, man, this is my first podcast. This was, you hit me with a lot of questions. Um, this is good. This is good. Yeah, a lot of questions. I think there's, um, I, I have a story, you know, right? And so when, you know, I've recently been talking to some people about investments and, I think people get so fixated. This is the one thing I will share with entrepreneurs and don't be so fixated on like the product. Like as you're thinking about, like if you want to be an entrepreneur, if you want to step out of your comfort zone, like the one thing that I've learned people oftentimes, you know, like if you're going into retail, yeah, they want return on their investment. Okay. You're selling a hundred units. Each of those units is $20. What's going to be a return on those units? In my, in my space and what I've learned traditionally is that people invest in people, right? Yeah, the product, okay, that, I get it. But I want to know about you, Steve Banks, what's your story? And I think my story is compelling, right? Like I've been told, like, I should write a book. You should do this. You should do that. Um, I recently got connected with, I don't know if you know the name, Dave Meltzer. 
Yeah, no. It's big time on LinkedIn and he, social media. He's actually on my board of advisors. So, so somebody who's like, she's like a mother figure to me. She's recently connected me with Dave and I'm thinking about getting, being a part of his program, but like he has a wealth of knowledge. But again, this is what I'm talking about. Like my network and getting connected to people and, and I've been following him for years, but I didn't, I didn't know my mom knew him. Yeah, Dave, Dave's great. Like, he's my board of advisors. I've been on his IG Live, talking about my company, you know. He just, he, he does he so much stuff. He reached out to me on the email and said, hey, man, let me know when you want. Cause I, I talked to a CEO, um, Colleen, and they chimed in. was like, Steve, I'm looking forward to getting to know you and meet you and hearing your story. Like, but people want to know your story. Yeah. Like, don't get so fixated on, like, the, the, the packaging and, like, be authentic and tell your story. And I think that's what, that's what will compel people. They want to know your story, where you've been and where you're going. And how can I help? That's the one thing I haven't always, as a, as a dude, I'm not even going to say as a black man, as a dude, I just haven't always asked for help. And now I'm in a place where I feel comfortable to ask for help and asking for help. The doors have That's one of Dave's big things. He's like, once a day you ask someone for help. Because well, we're always like, how can I help you? Yeah. But we never, like, once a day ask someone how they can help you. Yeah. Like, he's real big on that. Yeah, yeah for sure. No, it's, it's, it's crazy, man. It's crazy how it's all coming together, man. But I'm, I'm, I'm here for the ride. I'm here for the long haul. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Steve, sure. thanks for your time today. Really appreciate it. Appreciate it, Jason. Thank you. And to our listeners, thanks for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.